He's capable right. of oh, yeah. leaving prison and getting to the mm -hmm. palace, so why not? You want to get to, to Senegal. You, want why to, not? you also want to go to prison. I no, 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 no. I am very particular. <laughs> palace. I can't survive a day in prison. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So now let's take it away. Let's take you back to the local scene where President William Ruto has directed all semi autonomous commercial government institutions to be remitting 80% of their net profits after tax to the National Treasury. The president, who met chairpersons and chief executive officers of parastatals at State House Nairobi, said the institutions belong to Kenyans who should get returns for their investment. During a meeting held at State House, President Ruto pointed out the need for fiscal discipline in the use of public funds, stressing that the recurrent budgets of state owned corporations must undergo rigorous audit to stamp out corruption and misuse. They bring nothing, they just take away what we need for our roads, what we need for our water, what we need for electricity connection. Those institutions that are making losses, they have no plan, they have no intention of uh, doing anything. Please, we will shut them down. President Ruto further advised parastatal CEOs to leverage on technology to find optimum ways of running operations and maximizing profits. The president directed that the government, including state corporations, to live within means and that the expenditure must never exceed revenues collected by the semi-autonomous institutions to cut their budgets by 30 percent. So we must cut down on our expenditure. We must rationalize. We must make it much more efficient. We must deal firmly and decisively with pilferage and wastage and theft. The president further directed commercial state corporations to remit 80% of their net profits to the national treasury as regulatory institutions are to remit 90% of their surplus funds. We are going to deliver the services that the people of Kenya expect of us manage their taxes well, cut down on expenditure, reduce on borrowing. Meanwhile, President Ruto has urged Kenyans to enlist onto TVET programs to enhance their skills. The president was speaking at the centenary celebration at Nyeri National Polytechnic. You can bet that that particular directive by the president is going to affect a series of power statals as we will be seeing as we sample uh, what stories have been making headlines as captured by the various dailies here is that 140 sagas and uh, power statals are set to be closed if they continue making losses and that means job losses there. We'll be unpacking that as we proceed. Now, police in Morang are investigating an incident where two people were allegedly murdered in cold blood by a suspected serial killer. According to the residents, the suspect, who is an ex-convict, had served seven years in prison for murder-related cases. The residents, who say they are living in fear, have called on the security apparatus to assure them of their security after the suspect allegedly vowed to kill more people in the area. The serial killer is at large. <laughs> residents of Chui village in Gitugi Ward, Mathia constituency, Muranga County, are living in fear. After a serial killer allegedly hacked two men to death, <laughs> Lillian Kamau, the mother to one of the men killed by the serial killer, could not bear the loss. Residents say the suspect who is an ex convict had served seven years in prison for murdering Kezia Mudoni and Joseph Gaita. Tension is high in the village after the suspect threatened to kill more people. 
with investigations ongoing to establish the motive behind his actions. Ana semekana kuna watu wengine alikuwa ametaja taja. Sasa sijui kama ameridhika na hao ama anaweza rudi achukue hao wengine. Sasa tunaomba serikali ikuje haraka. Ituondolee huu mtu hapa. Kwa kijiji watu wana hofu bila hawajui nani mwingine atakuja kuelea hiyo mambo. The serial killer is still on the loose. In my opinion, that is a community that has been betrayed by the justice system because if he served seven years for having murdered two people, I don't think that was a just sentencing and it should be looked into. In the meantime, if you have any information that may lead to his arrest before he takes another life, kindly get in touch with the security apparatus down in Moranga. Disruptions in the healthcare sector might be heading to the worst, with the Kenya National Union of Medical Laboratory Officers becoming the latest health workers union to issue a strike notice. The medical laboratory officers want all interns who served under the Universal Health Coverage Program confirmed, among other de demands. The Kenyan Union of Clinical Officers has already issued a one-week strike notice commencing Monday, while doctor's strike enters the 14th day. Doctors in Nakuru County talked to the county government to meet their demands as the national doctor strike entered day 13 Tuesday. The national government yeah. and the county government of Nakuru yeah. County will have a shortage of doctors yeah. unless you employ more doctors yeah. as per the CBA yeah. as, as, as per the WHO we are not going back to work. A similar scenes were witnessed in Meru County where doctors vowed not to go back to work until the government fully implements their collective bargaining agreement. The majority of these people are doctors and majority of them, they are doctors who have just cleared school but they are languishing in poverty at home because uh, the Minister of Health has not uh, posted them to do internship. And matters in the healthcare sector are not getting any better with the Kenya National Union of Medical Laboratory Officers joining their clinical officers' peers in issuing a one-week strike notice. Submitted a recognition agreement request in 2021. Today is 2024. We did a follow-up letter last year, July 13th, to the ministry, and to date it's unfortunate that they have never responded back. We continue keeping tabs on that particular situation. Now, Lamu County government misappropriated 108 million shillings. This is according to the Senate Public Accounts Committee probing the usage of the funds in the financial year 2020-2021, which is unaccounted for in the Auditor General's report. The current governor, Issa Timami, was hard-pressed to explain how the funds were utilized. Here are the details of the probe and the happenings within the precincts of Parliament. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, I think it is strange that uh, we are not able to provide that. So it draws us to the conclusion that money was collected and stolen by county officers because in the absence of that schedule, then we cannot uh, confirm that the 108 million was a true reflection of what was collected. In his defense, Lamu Governor Isatimami told the committee the loss of the 108 million shillings in on source revenue happened before his tenure in office. So I think to that extent, Governor, I must reprimand your officers for not providing uh, you know, that supporting documentation. But you seem to be aware that there were two officers. There were two members of staff involved. Uh, one was a lady and another was a man. And uh, they were on contract. What I can confirm is right now they are no longer in service. The Auditor General in his report said the circumstances, accuracy, completeness and propriety of the funds could not be confirmed. It further emerged two county officers were fired for alleged theft of two receipts books from the devolved unit. Meanwhile, the Teachers Service Commission CEO Nancy Masharia was before the Senate Committee on Trade where she revealed plans to meet the teachers union not following an uproar of a proposed amendments to the teachers service commission act of 2012 we are still engaging the stakeholders we have 
actually invited all the unions again after the, we started. Mashara dismissed claims the proposals are meant to punish teachers. Civil servants occupying government houses will soon have to dig deeper into their pockets after the state announced plans to increase rent to the housing units located in various parts of the country. Housing and Urban Planning Principal Secretary Charles Hinger, while appearing before the National Assembly Public Accounts Committee, said his office had written to the National Treasury to allow them to increase their rent as par. The last review was done in 2001, which is 23 years ago. Hinga said they need more rental income for the refurbishment owing to wear and tear over the years. Now to the corridors of justice. A 221 million shillings fraud case against Transoya Senator Alan Chesang and six others adjourned prematurely after the senior or other senator failed to turn up for the afternoon session during the hearing of his case. Chesang, who attended the morning session virtually from abroad, could not be reached in the afternoon, forcing Nairobi Chief Magistrate Lucas Oinya to suspend the sittings to June. Meanwhile, a warrant of arrest has been issued against business tycoon Yagesh Devani for failing to honor court summons. More details in the Scales of Justice segment with Ruth and Michael Mondiga. The senator has from Monday been attending court virtually after his lawyer said he was in Switzerland for parliamentary business. His absence during the afternoon sitting did not augur well with the prosecution who demanded he appears in court physically. And identification parades for another day. So that we will have moved forward and taken care of all the other interests. The court directed the hearing to continue from 4th to 7th of June 2024 and the senator be physically present. Senator Chesang is accused of allegedly producing a fake purchase order worth 210 million shillings, purporting it to be from proprietor of McKinder Motors Limited. Elsewhere, a warrant of arrest has been issued against business tycoon Agnesh Devani after he failed to appear in court in a 1.5 billion shillings fraud case. They that decidedly there has to be a fair trial, no miscarriage of justice, and under no circumstances, prejudice should be caused to the accused person. The prosecution told Senior Principal Magistrate Robinson on the time the he is accused of using his company, Triton, to defraud Kenya Commercial Bank Oil worth 1.5 billion shillings. Finally, three businessmen have denied conspiring to defraud an Asian investor 60 million shillings to supply laptops. They were released on a bond of 3 million shillings each with a surety. That this be subject to photographs of the same being taken in case they are required in evidence. From the courts to matters business where about 194,000 affordable smartphone devices have been assembled in Kenya since the official start of production in October last year. Information, Communication and the Digital Economy Cabinet Secretary Elib Owalo says the affordable smartphone production is part of a wider plan to expand the range of smart devices and electronics to, meet, to be made at the Konza Technopolis. Projects such as the Jitume Digital Program, launch of Wi-Fi hotspots, and at least 1,450 innovation hubs are part of Kenya's digitization efforts. Kenya joined the League of Smartphone Producers in October last year. The plan is to deepen digital transformation in Kenya by expanding the local production of smartphones at the Konza Technopolis. Moving forward, apart from telephones, we will ensure that we embark on manufacture of both computer hardware and cons co computer software right here in Kenya. And we have already put in place the requisite infrastructure within our Konza Technopolis. Already affordable smartphones are being manufactured at the East Africa Device Assembly Kenya Limited, a joint venture of local mobile network operators and international device manufacturers. Create an enabling environment for the private sector to come in and invite, uh, invest in these spaces. He was speaking during the launch of the University of Nairobi's new ICT initiatives, where he emphasized the need to tailor some courses to job opportunities online. I want to appeal to the university, Banavice Chancellor, 
to find ways and means, and we are able to support, to support you. We are ready and available to support you, to ensure that on the digital platforms and systems that you have established here, the students of this great institution can also become earners within those digital platforms. These uh, innovations that we are launching today, this platform we're running today, whatever challenges that you have, we will be there to improve them so that we get to the next level. Only 20% of businesses have registered the electronic tax invoice management system days before the lapse of the deadline on the 31st of this month. The Kenya Revenue Authority is urging all business owners to ensure they integrate their invoicing with e-teams in order to minimize the risk of tax invoice disputes. Of the 915,000 businesses targeted, only 190,000 have so far complied. We have a simplified solution that can be accessed on uh, USSD, that is uh, star triple two hash, and on that you are able to actually um, get a menu for uh, KRA, uh, which is KRA payments number five, and uh, you, once you select that then you are able to register for ETIMS and you are able to issue your invoices instantly. ETIMS is not a tax, it's just a software for invoicing and receipting where uh, we are just uh, adopting technology to be able to use in form of uh, generating our receipts. And the fact that uh, we are talking about the 31st uh, March deadline does not mean that it is the end of onboarding. The only thing is that we need all taxpayers to be on board so that um, they can support each other when it comes to accounting for expenses, especially when they purchase from each other in their income tax return when it comes to determination of their tax liability. Still on business, about 782 small and medium and entrepreneurs have been trained and offered financing under the Tony Elumelu Foundation to help them grow their businesses. United African Bank Managing Director Mary Mulili is urging women to apply for seed capital grant at the 3,000 slots offered across Africa to women entrepreneurs. The knowledge that they've tapped through this program uh, is, is very rich. Even from where we sit as a bank, one, they are entrepreneurs and they have knowledge on how to run businesses. So going through the program um, helped me understand the business from a formation standpoint, number one, and secondly, how do I structure my partnerships? Now to sports, preparations for the highly anticipated third leg of the FIA World Rally Championship, the WRC Safari Rally Kenya, are close to completion, setting the stage for an electrifying showdown from the 28th of March to the 31st of March in Naivasha. The event, which marks its 71st staging in the country, will be officially flagged off by President William Ruto at the Kenyatta International Convention Center on Thursday before traversing the Rift Valley, spanning over several farms, ranches, and conservancies around Lake Naivasha and Lake Elementator. An impressive lineup of 29 entries featuring Thierry Nouveau of Hyundai, Shell Mobi team currently leading the championship standings, and Adrian Formax of M -Sport, M Sport Ford aiming to score valuable championship points. Local fans will also have plenty to cheer for with former Kenyan champion Carl Flash Tundu and Karan Patel, Patel leading the eight man charge. We've been blessed, a bit of rain. Um, so hopefully it will keep the fresh fresh down in Kedong, uh, keep the dust down at Kasarani, um, the super special stage. It's going to be a great rally. Uh, my advice to the fans, please obey the marshals. Um, traffic, please let's keep to our lanes, don't overlap. There will be traffic. It may take you an hour longer to get where you're going, but please obey traffic marshals, obey the traffic police. I highly advise people to get gumboots. I think it's going to be a bit wet. Get umbrellas, 
get some ponchos, uh, prepare for a bit of um, wet weather. Now, before we tell you why we actually scored against ourselves in a game between Kenya and Zimbabwe, let's look at the last batch of Team Kenya that have arrived home uh, from Accra, Ghana, after finishing 10th at the 2024 Africa Games. The athletics team bagged 21 medals in the athletics competition and is the latest team to arrive home after boxing, handball, hockey and volleyball teams landed yesterday from Ghana. Kenya bagged a total of 37 medals in the quarter Quadradial Games, 8 gold, 8 silver and 21 bronze medals. In boxing, Edwin Okongo defeated El Kwas Yassin of Morocco on a split points decision of 3-1 to win Kenya her first gold medal in the Africa Games for 17 years. Okongo plays for Kenya Defense Forces in the local boxing league championship. Martha Amina won a bronze medal after she lost to Nigeria's South Pole boxer Shukurat Karim on points in the semi-finals of the Bantamweight Clash. Kenya had sent a team of four boxers to the Continental Games including Okongo, Amina Martha, welterweight Vincent Ocheng and heavyweight Peter Abuti. At Olympic that week, I was able to get a lot of my fellow colleagues, boxers, I was able to push to Niliona, Niki Viangu, Niliona was a Kabisa, Kabisa, Kabisa. Nasante Sana Piaqua, teammates, Kuakuni, Push, Kazuezi, Nakwa coaches, Piaqua Kono and Kuana and Dalia weaknesses za opponent na wanazitumia sana wananiambia nazitumia ku box tunashukuru tumeweza kupata medali ya dhahabu baada ya miaka 17 na tunanuia kupatia wachezaji wageni eh, nafasi katika mashindano zijazo ili tuweze kuwa na timu ambayo itatuwakilisha kwa muda mrefu meanwhile the National Volleyball Team of Falme Strikers also arrived home last evening after bagging a silver medal at the quadrennial games Wafalme bagged silver after losing by straight sets to Egypt in the final. The athletics team arrived home today from Ghana after finishing fourth in the athletics competition with six gold, six silver and eight bronze medals. The gold medals came from Brian Komen in 1500 meters, Mary Mora in 800 meters, Emily Ngi in the walk race, Beatrice Chepkoech, Staple Chess, Janet Chepnetic in the 10,000 meters and Aaron Cheminingwa in 800 meters race. Kenya finished 10th overall with 21 medals, 8 gold, 8 silver and 21 bronze medals. Egypt topped the standings with 192 medals, followed by Nigeria with 121 medals. Congratulations to our sportsmen and women there and also we have a reason to congratulate our sportsmen, especially Harambe Stars. Why? Now the four nations... Um, finals happened yesterday and this was a game that was played between 6 p.m and uh, yeah 6 p.m between zimbabwe and kenya where we won that is kenya won harambe stars scoring three goals against a solitary own goal to zimbabwe though so we got a red card also uh, from uh, richard o odada was handed a red card there and uh, joseph okumu uh, scored for the opposing team that is Zimbabwe but nonetheless Kenya emerged top in this four nations uh, football tournament that was being showcased by KBC Channel 1 your true sports partner using our various channels including KBC Channel 1 and Y254 and this is also what is going to happen all the way from Thursday till we culminate WRC, you will not miss any aspect of the action that is going to be going down at in Naivasha for the WRC. So do keep it KBC Channel 1 if you're not going to be making it down to WRC, Naivasha. And if you are, kindly observe the traffic rules. We do not have want to have more cases of uh, fatalities and such during this special showpiece. I'm Regina Manyara. I live in the capable hands of my colleagues to take you through the rest of the programming. Some of the stories that we're going to be keeping tabs on is of the ongoing doctor's strike that enters day 14 today, given that we have various arms or rather various umbrella bodies representing medics across uh, the country also joining in uh, when it comes to matters of strike. Some of the demands seeming similar, the, uh, you know, the employment of um, interns, better pay and such. We'll be keeping tabs on that. That. And also, just a quick reminder, if you may have information that may lead 
to the arrest of the serial killer in Muranga, who was just released from prison and yesterday took the lives of two. Kindly get in touch with the relevant authorities. Have a good day ahead. Channel One. We are a TV station like no other. Get a taste of the best in entertainment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Feel the passion. Will you promise me? I swear that you will never lose me. I can't get married to you. I'm sure you know about it. That's why you are making fun of me. Experience the drama. Get out. Who is the man in this one? Ah, win. And the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Move to the beat. We are live from Broadcasting House and get informed on the latest happenings. <laughs> KBC Channel One. <laughs> We are the full package. Oh, yes. And Kenya's watching. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a very exciting moment, not just for Naivasha, not just for the county of Nakuru but also for Kenya. thing is crazy. I mean, the sheer speed, you can hardly see the road. These guys are really professional. It's really something out of this world. Ask me whether I want to do this again. Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> KBC Channel 1 imeanda vipindi speciali katika mwezi mtukufu wa Ramadhan mwaka huu kwa ajili yako. Allahu Akbar. Asalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kando na ukumbi wa Kiislamu na hutuba ya Ijumaa kutakuwa na makala yanayoangazia maswala ya funga, mawaidha, whoever witnesses the month of Ramadhan then he should fast. Vipindi vya mapishi katika mapishi ya Ramadhan tutatayarisha pilau ya korofo utahitaji viazi vitungu vinne vikubwa na zabibu na kaswida mbali mbali Ramadhan kana pia tumekuandalia kalenda ya Ramadhan ili kukuweka kwenye mstari wa mbele katika funga yako tazama runinga ya KBC Channel 1 katika mwezi huu mtukufu wa Ramadhan ili kukuza na kuhifadhi imani yako When I was all alone in this world, I mean, I never could find any spiritual assistance. When I was even the helpless to understand the meaning of life, even the meaning of despair was beyond me. Three years ago, you gave me and Zhu Lian Luo's Fang Wei and Peace Ring. I hope you will never have the second one. Those murdered scientists, they all suddenly changed. Is it because they encountered outsiders? Yes. 
Good morning. Welcome back. It's now 10 minutes past 7 a.m. It's Wednesday. Welcome back to the program after Regina with the news bulletin. It's now time for us to get straight into our discussion today. Today being the viewpoint, I want to take a look at really what has been happening across the country in as far as politics and socio-economic aspects of our lives is concerned. We are going to get that later on. My guest already in studio, I have got Peter Rero, who is representing the great people of Kibra, Kibera, um, which is which? Kibra, Kibra. Kibera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, which is Kibra, but it is known Kibera. Kib so, which is which? Kibera, I'm a Kibra. Kibra constituency. Kibra constituency. Yeah. Very ka karibu sana. Yeah, thank you so much. Karibu, karibu. And Wilson Sosion, of course, with us here uh, from a NAT section. Um, and uh, I say this CAS. Karibu. Say it with confidence. <laughs> CAS. Chief Administrative Secretary. The word CAS would mean so many things. Karibu <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> Would mean so many things. Welcome to the program. Uh, yeah, thank you. Karibu. Good morning. All right, gentlemen, before I get back there, let me give my audience what is uh, the traffic situation on the road. Uh, yes, so that you can get to you, your offices or your to your destination pretty fast. Okay, let me start with... Uh, uh, Waiyaki Way, Waiyaki Way, as usual, all moving pretty fine as you come all the way from Kangemi, coming to ABC Place. And uh, around, yeah, they all, the entire stretch is moving pretty fine until you come to around Safaricom House when you're just about to join the, this is called Kwachif. Around Safaricom here, there's always a place called Kwachif. Uh, there's a chief's camp somewhere there. And of course now joining the expressway, a bit of some snarl up there. But uh, after that, it's moving as you come towards uh, Westlands roundabout here until you pass Museum Hill, uh, getting into the CBD pretty fine. Nothing much to report about as far as that's concerned. What about Limuru Road? Limuru Road again. A uh, bit of some traffic, but not so that bad. You can manage about that one. Thicker Road, as usual. Today, uh, not so good. Look at that, uh, the expressway as well as the service lane all packed up and that is uh, extending all the way past Utali Hotel, going straight past uh, KCA University until around past De La Rue. We are at around all shops. This is Outer Ring Road. So all the way from Outer Ring coming down to Modiga Square here, this is where the traffic along Thika Road is at. So you have to be very much patient. If you don't have enough fuel, uh, think about it, think about it. Uh, the Campbell Road, heading towards the Directorate of Criminal Investigations there, looking not so okay. Be patient, Tafadali. How about uh, the other side of Mombasa Road? What Mombasa Road from Imaradaima, Mlolongo, etc., etc.? Nothing much to report about. Finally, let's take a look at what we have on Gong Road. Gong Road, the traffic here is at the meteorological department around this area, around the Junction Mall. After that, Kilakiti Kosao. As you come towards uh, RFU ground, all the way to uh, Prestige Plaza and all that moving pretty fine. So, yes, and ultimately, Valley Road into the CBD. Well, what do you have in Kisumu City? Nothing much to report about. This is the, the map of Kisumu and looking pretty good. Nothing so far to worry. My kinsmen uh, from the lakeside... Let's wake up and go to work. Finally, let's go to Mombasa. What do you have today here? Uh, around uh, this area, around Saba Saba, as there's a bit of some snarl up today. Uh, what Mombasa? Today, Mayamuka Mapema. Very good. Uh, the entire stretch of Makupa Causeway coming to the CBD again. Moving pretty fine. How about heading towards the new Nyali Bridge, Congo Ware, the entire stretch of, new, of, of Nyali Road. And yeah, so far, everything is okay. And uh, what to our ferry? Ndioi Hapa? Mukohapa today, the other side of Mombasa Island is busy. This is where we are. Look at that. All right? Uh, this is where we are. So it starts at around this roundabout heading toward Mamangina waterfront down there, uh, down to Likoni Ferry Channel. So up to that point, if you don't need to be on traffic, end up like waterfront down Galeve and Meli in Aingia. Uh, get some time off. Sour. So let's take a look at what we have on the front page of uh, local papers here. Let me start with the front page of the People Daily. On the People Daily, parastatal uh, bosses in big trouble. This is on the front page of the People Daily. Parastatal bosses in big trouble. Um, okay. Uh, the touch is uh, not responding pretty fine. I'll get it. Okay, fine. So President Ruto leads, uh, reads the riot act for non-performing state farm bosses to improve their fortunes or be phased out. 
That was declared yesterday when uh, during a pres meeting with the president at State House in Nairobi. So Ruto reads the riot act for non-performing state farm bosses to improve their fortunes or be phased out. That is what's on the front page. Still on the front page. Um, I think there's a problem with people daily, but I'll get it. Don't worry. Uh, okay, let me come back to that later on. How about the front page of the Standard newspaper? This is what we have on the front page of the Standard newspaper. Revealed faces of Shaka Hola's horror killings. This is the big revelation on the front page of the Standard newspaper. Revealed faces of Shaka Hola's horror killings. For the first time, Kenyans are able to see the victims of the Shaka Hola massacre, from young children to women and men, as a somber mood engulfs families thronging Malindi Hospital hospital mortuary to collect bodies of their loved ones. Now they have got that green light to collect the remains of their loved ones and uh, give them that befitting send-off. That is what is here. It's been months or not years of agony and pain for some of these families as well as that. You have got uh, some faces of some young children here. These are very young kids. Um, this is a picture of perhaps an entire family which was faced out during that um, uh, period of uh, Shekahola killings. And now the chief government pathologist, that is Johansen Odur, said that uh, families who've, uh, who've gotten their DNA tests ascertained can now pick their loved ones for final rights. This is what you have on the front page. Let me just go back to People Daily and see what you have here. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we have uh, parastatal bosses in big trouble. Let me start with you, uh, Molly Musosion, and get to hear what we have here on the front page. People Daily is messing me up today. I'll, I'll get it, don't worry. But at least you have an idea of what we are saying. Um, who is this trouble? Molly Musosion, just pick up. Yeah, not, not just an idea. Parastatals are profit-making entities and uh, that is how they are structured and fashioned mm -hmm. and uh, the, the president's directive is meant to reorient uh, the parastotals to operate uh, within profit yeah. making and uh, quite a number of parastotals have been making losses, yet uh, government has been injecting a lot of money to sustain them. Mm -hmm. So, indeed, it has reached a time in our economy we have to make prudent decisions that uh, we don't need to fund any parastotal yeah. anymore that is making losses. If it's making losses, then it doesn't make sense to exist. So. Uh, the the board chairs, board of directors, and chief executives mm -hmm. uh, are under pressure to ensure that all Paris totals are able to make profit, yeah. and that is for the good of Kenyans, for the good of the taxpayers, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's the right thing to do. For a long time, we've been pumping money to non-performing Paris totals, mm -hmm. so. They must perform. It isn't a choice. Parastatals, are they meant to make profit and remit to the national government, to the national treasury? Y yeah, of course, remittance to the national treasury, that is the national basket. That's the yes. national treasury of the Republic of Kenya, of the people of Kenya, which mm. is okay. You can't... You know, parastatals have been used as cash cows. And... Uh, for purposes of auditing and purposes of uh, accounting, mm. remitting all profits and revenue to the national treasury is a prudent thing to do. All right. Okay. So this is where we have it. Uh, the right act was read. So if you're not performing, then your goose is cooked. Uh, well, looking at it from a different perspective. Mm. We, we must go back to why these parastosos were formed. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the commercial ones, we have regulatory authorities, and uh, really they are supporting uh, uh, many areas in this country. Yeah. But where we are now, oh, we have realized that uh, some of these uh, uh, private entities mm. or parastatals, for that matter, are not making profits. We have had cases of uh, KAA mm -hmm. many times that the government has been pumping money 
for in Kenya Airways. Mm -hmm. But every year, after pumping a lot of money, we still see that the parastatal is still in debt. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was talking to uh, somebody from Senegal. Mm. Uh, she was in Kenya and said that the best airline uh, that they always use is Kenya Airways. Mm -hmm. But while at home here, we know that uh, Kenya Airways, they are not performing. But outside there, we, they have a very good name. So marrying these two, again, is, is very difficult. Mm. But uh, I want to align my thoughts with the same sentiments that uh, those parastatals which are making losses, either yeah. they must come up with measures that will see them rise again above this mm. in the next few years, mm -hmm. Or they, are, uh, they, they will be done away with. Mm -hmm. We cannot have uh, those parastatals which are blotted in terms of manpower. They are blotted in terms of uh, things that they want to do. Yet, in real sense, we are not getting anything out of it. Mm. So I think uh, it could be a radical idea. Uh, one is that many people are going to lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a government, we should have seen this coming, and we must have, we should have emphasized to, to the CEO from the very beginning yeah. that their role and their main duty is to ensure that these parastatals make profit. Mm. Not necessarily just making profit, but profit enough to, to, sustain, to themselves. sustain themselves. Yeah. And profit enough that this directive now that has been, I've seen that uh, now the, the president was saying, that they should remit 80 mm. percent of, of, of their profit yes let us look at it will this 80 percent make them go down what is the arithmetic what analysis mm. have they done to come with the 80 percent mm -hmm. and uh, uh, regulatory authorities 90 percent sometimes we need to look at what percentage really should be remitted to the treasury yeah so that these corporations also are able to sustain and pay their workers. Mm. We, let us not go into a situation that we remit a certain percentage to the treasury yeah. and we cannot pay the workers. So we must make profit to pay the workers to sustain themselves. That is when what remains mm. now it can be remitted to the treasury. But that percentage must also be looked at and... Uh, uh, there must be a consensus mm. yeah, with the CEOs yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, part of the highlights which came from Setos yesterday was that President Ruto also directed CEOs of state parastatals to reduce their current budget by 30% and commercial state corporations have also been directed to remit 80% of their profits after tax to the National Treasury. That's exactly what you've said. And also President Ruto also warned that uh, the government budgets and expenditures will be subjected to rigorous scrutiny. I think this is just but, uh, another part of austerity, me austerity measure to curb wastage, as per what he said, Molim Sosion, that uh, to curb wastage of public funds in some of these, so what he said, funds gobbling state firms, funds gobbling state firms um, to face that. So that is what you have here on the front page of the People Daily. All right, let's cross over and see what we have on the front page of the Daily Nation. Uh, something uh, again, we have job losses as 100 and state, uh, 140 state firms to go again. Uh, the same issue here, uh, job losses as 140 state firms to go. That is the issue of parastatals. We have it there. Um, President Ruto announces plans to shut down loss-making state corporations. Uh, there's, uh, yes, on the front page of the, of the Daily Nation there. So thousands of workers risk losing their jobs in a renewed push by the government to merge or wind up parastatals that are performing similar functions uh, or draining public coffers by being perennially in the red. This is what you have. The story is fleshed down there for you on page 4 and 5. So this is what you have. Again, audit reveals a uh, grim reality of maternity hospitals in uh, counties. Uh, the other side of devolved function from insufficient equipment to shortage of trained health workers to... Na mm, okay. All right, uh, to having share incubators, that is, uh, young ones shared incubators as mothers share beds, etc., etc. So some of the audit conducted in Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, Nakuru, Bungoma, Taita Taveta, West Pokot, Makweni, Siaya, Isiola and Garissa counties evaluated the state 
of maternal and newborn health services in public hospitals. That is what we have here. Again, nothing to mention, but gentlemen, he's the youngest president so far, only at 44, Senegal. You said you talked to somebody from Senegal. Uh, are they happy there? Uh, the youngest. My colleague Regina says that uh, she's a happy lady right now. <laughs> she's happy. She's going to take a flight to Senegal. Uh, Re Regina, stick here. He's the youngest. One president, two first ladies. Meet Senegal's Basuri Faye. Where were you at the age of 44, Mishimiwa Sosion and you? Uh, I think you were together those days. You know, he was my senior. Yes. When he was the secretary general. At 44, yeah. I was a senior principal mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, we are the, the, the youngest president right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is when you are at your peak. Yes. I realized that, that I was, uh, the time I was a senior principal mm -hmm. at Upper School. Mm -hmm. You find that you have a lot of energy. Yeah. You don't fear bringing changes uh -huh. that people would not want. Yeah. But also at that age, you, you, you can relate very well still with the youth. Mm. But again, you are also heading to the senior. So you are in a, a very strategic age. At the age of 44. At the age of 44. Yes. I think it, it, that is where we are most productive. Yes. Uh, it is also, it gives people a challenge. You know, we have a youth bulb. Mm. And uh, now the youth would want to see one of them rise. But at this, the same time, we need to have uh, experience. So we are, we are going to see how it's going to juggle around mm. and uh, ensure that Senegal uh, comes up. It's a good country. Yeah. Senegal is a good country. And I think when people decide, mm. we must respect their, their, their choices. We only wish them well. Uh, as part of good countries in Africa, mm. uh, it's also a member of ECOWAS. Yeah. You know, those West African countries uh, do their businesses together. Mm. In fact, they have a t uh, the, you can freely move uh, within those countries. So they, have, they form economic block, yes. which I think, when it is well honest, it, it will give uh, a great economic growth mm. in West Africa. Yeah. So I wish him well. Exactly. exactly. Yes. He's beaten Maki Sall, who was the, actually is the outgoing. Maki Sall has been in power. And uh, he's also, again, former prime minister. That is uh, Amadou Ba, who was uh, Maki Sall's, uh, I mean, favorite. I mean, I mean this You've asked where I was at 44. <laughs> And what I was doing at 44. Exactly, what are you doing at the... <laughs> that is almost 11 years ago. I yes. was national chairman, Kenyan National mm -hmm. Union of Teachers. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was around 2011, 2012. Mm. Uh, that was my peak of productivity within the union. And uh, that is uh, when I thought of successfully uh, employment of teachers on mm. contract and mm. company. 12, uh, that is when I led a 24 days nationwide strike to ensure that teachers were paid equally like civil servants and government was able to release 17 billion yes. shillings. Mm -hmm. So when I look at uh, a new president at that age, it's an opportunity for that country uh, to turn around. And uh, this is an indicator of where Africa is headed to. Mm. Leadership is shifting to the young generation, and people must accept that. And, and this is good for democracy, and this is very good for evolution and progression of the continent. If you look at the global north, mm. uh, we have uh, presidents who are as young as 32 years old, uh, so that the guys who are old like me and Orero can mm. just concentrate in enjoying retirement and doing other things. Yeah. <laughs> then you let the... <laughs> younger generation to run the country and uh, that is where we are headed to in in in, in many countries in in africa mm. africa in african leadership to me shifting to the younger generation yeah more vibrant more focused and uh, and and uh, this these are i would believe champions of the fourth industrial revolution mm. uh, i think it's a challenge to them to transform the continent. Even as we look at uh, African Agenda 2063, and uh, we are looking at the African continental free trade area. My brothers talked about the airlines. It should be very cheap for a Kenyan to fly to Senegal and for any African mm. to move around. We must uh, remove the borders within the continent of Africa. And 
allow Africa to be a strong economic bloc, yeah. leading in manufacturing, and uh, it should be an economy of its own mm. once we open the borders. And so it's an opportunity for the young generation to... Yeah. Life. to, to yeah, take yeah. up res full responsibility yeah, like, exactly. and transform so, the country. Uh, there's something I'll pick. So it's true. Life begins at 40. I hope you are there. <laughs> <laughs> Life begins at 40. Let's take a break. But before that, uh, remember to download your app. That is KBC uh, app. You can get everything you want from podcasts, sports, etc., etc. Um, you can take a look at that again. Gashago urges leaders to forgive each other. Focus on building the nation. He said that it was just politics. So uh, he's also seeking for, for forgiveness from the Kenyatta family. That is from a president. That, uh, yes, Tuliongea Mambo Mengi Lakini, that is nature of politics. You can take a look at everything that you want again. Loss. That's uh, something we are going to talk about here. Yes, we want to discuss it shortly after this. Again, everything is here. Everything is here. Uh, take a look. Download that app on uh, App Store or Google Play and enjoy every bit of it. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with more. Stay with us. Kenya Broadcasting Corporation is Kenya's most trusted news and entertainment brand. Grow your business, acquire more clients, and reach new, diverse audiences by advertising with us. We connect brands to audiences that matter, driving results for brands and enhancing your current marketing strategies. We have packages for all needs, and no product is too small for us. Contact us today and capitalize on our combined power of radio, TV, and digital platforms. KBC, connecting Kenyans. I'm Lina Tayuko. I'll be navigating Pauline in the Safari Rally. I started rallying 2010. Uh, I've sat with different drivers, uh, made sure they've gotten to the ramp. Uh, yes, I've won different awards every year for the last actually almost 14 years. And um, it's, been, it's been a great journey. I've uh, been given an opportunity by, actually, I've sat majority with the male drivers who've so been given an opportunity to navigate when I didn't think it's possible and then now ending up sitting with the ladies and just showing everybody that it's possible too. Um, I'm hoping to do the full season. That's my goal every year. So Safari is my first one this year. We missed uh, the car was not ready for the first event. So we are starting with Safari. I'm hoping to be at the awards. Leave alone WRC. I love the Kenyan awards because it, it makes me want to show up and just inspire somebody else also to plug in and I'm hoping this year there will be more ladies during the season because I am tired of being alone. Best moments? Um, I, there are many. <laughs> there are different uh, um, there are stages you, you get through and uh, getting through uh, Kedong is one of my 
<laughs> Kedong is the getting through Kedong is one of my most important days, and also so it's, uh, no 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 uh, sleeping warrior. Sleeping Warrior and Kedong, I find them the most complicated. And then Hell's Gate at the end of the day might be short, but it's tricky. But I normally look forward to finishing those three stages because once you get those three through the three stages, then you're good to go. Come and support. Um, uh, follow the rally through KBC. Last year they did a fantastic job. Um, looking forward to this year also. Come support. Stay safe. Do not drink and drive. Um, give way to the drivers and just uh, come have fun and show Kenyans that it's possible and enjoy. now is karibu sana welcome back to the program all of us now have a cup of coffee what about you uh okay so, so today i want us to talk about before i get to that again on the front page of people daily for the sake of fairness we have this politicians feel ethnic hiring in parastatal that is also on the front page of the people daily politicians feel ethnic hiring in parastatals that is also on the front page of the pl the star newspaper reports shows that bosses continue to flood entities with the tribesmen and women in um, disregard of the law that is what you have here again uh, down there is uh, pictures of the striking doctors which enters uh, day 14 today and um, they say that enough is enough uh, but this is now happening across the country and uh, remember the governors also council of governors have also asked the striking doctors to resume work and um, help the distraught patients in their various uh, constituencies as well as counties and uh, Susanna Kumicha who is also the CS for health has also said that, um, yeah, things will lock out, but you need to find an amicable solution to the strike. That is what you have here. But on the front page of the Star newspaper is about the politician feeling ethnic hirings in Paris Turtles. I think that is just that. Okay, so uh, le let's come back home and talk about this. So we all know that schools are closing sometimes this week. Uh, not sometimes, but better part of this week. Some of them are even doing their exams. And uh, by Friday, all goes well, some of them will go home. But now, as per the standard, is why public secondary schools may close early. The reason being is that institutions face crisis due to delayed release of capitation money and CAPTCHA says that officials, it, uh, that it is getting difficult to sustain school operations. We have got Bilo Kipsang and CS Machogu here in the picture. So gentlemen, with your background in education, I want us to talk about this. How hard is it to run schools? Let me start with you, uh, Urero. How hard is it to run schools? That is a very simple question. Yes, students are paying school fees, yes, but with capitation or with no capitation, you can break it down for us. How easy or how hard is it to run a school with roughly a thousand students? Uh, I cannot even imagine how it is in those schools. Uh, fortunately, I was there once, mm -hmm. and I think my colleague was also there once. It has become increasingly very difficult for school managers to run the schools. One is that uh, we have a economic uh, hardship. The parents are not able to pay fees yes. because they don't have the money. But one striking thing is that uh, they have also been asked, the, the principals have been asked not to chase any student away from school, yet they are also not able to pay school fees. Those running boarding schools have held, the, the, the suppliers are refusing to give uh, commodities uh, to these uh, schools because they cannot pay. In fact, schools now, if you were to do audit, mm -hmm. 
the pending bills. They also have pending bills. I would wish that uh, the Ministry of Education, they take time and also do audit of the pending bills in schools. Not because the principals like, but because they lack money. Two, I think what, last week when we talked with the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. they had assured us that within uh, 10 days they will release capitation to schools. Now those 10 days have elapsed. The 10 days have elapsed and the schools are closing. And therefore, yes. the capitation for this term, not even 50% has been released. In, 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 the, in the circular, the ministry had said they would be releasing 50% in the first term. Yes. Uh, going on the ground, you, you will find that they have released less than 4,000 for, for students mm -hmm. in school. Mm -hmm. Now, this capitation is not able to sustain these students in schools. We do not even know how the boarding schools operate. So we are expecting that these schools will close down in the future. I don't think people will be able to run the schools yeah. if the government is not going to release the capitation to schools on time. Mm. Because these are budgetary allocations. We were doing BPS and these monies have been allocated. But we are told that uh, they are, the monies have not been released from the exchequer. Mm. Now we are asking ourselves, then why do we put these uh, monies in a budgetary allocation for schools? Yeah. We, then we need not to put the budgetary allocation. And uh, what is also intriguing is that uh, initially it was 22,000 shillings. Mm. It has come down to about 16,000 shillings per school. Mm -hmm. And this 16,000 is also not released on a time. So how do we expect that these schools can run? Yeah. I think this could be one of the reasons why the schools are closing early, mm. not just because of the, the, the holidays that we are going to have, but most importantly, it is because these schools have no money and the government is not talking about it. Can the, can the schools run with school fees alone, without the capitation? It cannot run because it forms a, a part of the budget. When you are told that this money will be released to schools, mm -hmm. so you, you, you budget minus the 22,000 shillings. Yeah. It's a big gap. If 22,000 per student, mm -hmm. you can imagine if you have 3,000 students in school. I know schools with uh, 3,000, even up to 5,000 mm -hmm. students. Even my primary school, Olympic, has 5,580 students. There are big schools in high school with over 5,000 sc uh, students. 5,580 students? Yes, in Olympic primary. is one of the biggest uh, in the country. Okay. You can imagine. So if you are running such a school and you have no competition, and it is budgeted, like in secondary, at 22,000 per student, now it is 17,000 or 16,000 per student, how many millions are those mm, in a yeah. school? So, if we are serious as a government, then we must release this capitation to schools on time. But if they cannot, then they ask the parents to pay, which they, I know they will not ask the parents to pay. There are some schools where the parents have even agreed mm. to subsidize mm -hmm. for the sake of their students because they cannot survive. The money is not there, the capitation is not there, but still they are being capped that they must only charge up to a given. There are schools which parents are poor cannot pay, yes. but there are schools where parents can pay. So we, we really need to look at, if we cannot give capitation, what alternative do we have? Then do we have we, to resort back to the olden days where it, parents used to pay school fees straight? And, and I think we had moved from that. We had reached a point mm. where we had free day secondary education, where all the children in this country are supposed to transit to the next level without paying school yeah, fees. Yeah. We had reached that level. We cannot go back 20 years where we had come from. Mm -hmm. I think it is the interest in the interest of this country that the government takes education in this country very seriously. Well, Mr. Sion, go ahead. <laughs> And I think the government is taking it extremely seriously, particularly mm. Kenya Kwanzaa administration. I have been in this space of campaigning for fully funded mm -hmm. delivery of equitable quality public education. And I call it public because delivering education through basic education through private avenues is not what is desirable yes and uh, when you look at kenya the allocation to education is at least six percent of the gdp 
which is the set minimum global standards. Mm. And at least 15% of the overall budget. Mm. That is what UNESCO recommends. But we are doing close to 27, 28%. The only thing that we are dealing here is delays in remittances, which I don't think is an extremely serious thing. It doesn't affect uh, matters to do with procurement. And what is it that government is paying and mm. what is it that parents are paying? As a country, we should migrate fully to day education. And that is why we've talked of deboarding. I think all these matters of boarding schools and procurement and huge costs, you, you see uh, procurement in terms of uniform, uh, uh, at astronomic prices that parents cannot pay, mm. the accountability questions about the whole funding of education. And, and we have seen what some members of parliament have done, like uh, in uh, of Kehar, that mm -hmm. is, has been able to reorganize education funding in, in the constituency and support infrastructure to the ex even meals, up to meals and uniforms. And it is possible that the money that is devolved is able to finance education fully yep. until parents are only able to pay mm -hmm. a thousand shillings. There are questions here of how effectively do uh, do we optimize the use of this money mm. through clear accountability mm -hmm. structures mm. it would be wrong to say oh the schools have been, somebody somewhere has decided we close down schools simply because of delay in remitting money and you are closing down only for a week you, you are losing a week yeah when you lose that one week uh, uh, economically, how does it change? I think the, it's, it's wrong to link sensational decisions of this nature with delayed funding. That is a term, school term program mm. that is set out and a curriculum to be delivered within that period. And I'm sure teachers planned and they did their schemes of work up to the very last day. They should be allowed to deliver that. Now, the money being remitted by government through capitation has got specific voters. It has nothing to do with feeding. I'm seeing arguments that schools are going to close because capitation has not been released to school, so schools are unable to feed children. I think that is misinformation. Government does not pay any cent for feeding of students mm. in schools. It doesn't. It is about tuition. It's about some operation, payment of salaries for staff and the rest. Yes. Because still, that salary will be paid, mm. even if it delays. So really... I, don't, I, I see a lot of mismatch in what the delay can cause the closure of schools. It cannot whatsoever because it's about tuition, it's about learning resources and materials, which of course the boards of management can procure through their tender systems mm. and remit the payments to, to, the pro, to the entities that have procured goods and services from when money is, is, is paid. So I don't see, there is no reason whatsoever that the term instructional period that is outlined by the ministry yes. can be disrupted simply because of delay in remittances. Mm. The other aspects for operation that is uh, uh, feeding and boarding and the rest is the responsibility of parents and it's a matter of choice. And uh, Others have been supported through bursaries and several other programs. Mm -hmm. It is time in this country we get down to the bottom of things. And I'm happy Mwishimiwa is here. You have seen what other Mwishimiwa are doing. We can all have a national model so that we know the resources that we have, what is it that it can do so that we free the households completely mm. from... from, uh, from uh, from responsibilities of payment and we avoid confusion so that we know what is what and uh, very lastly yes the remittances of capitation is at 50 percent first term 30 percent second term 20 percent third term well we know it may not have been remitted in that particular manner because mm. of the fiscal challenge that the Treasury has, but eventually that has to be released. And so I think the, the Ministry of Education and Treasury should have a robust, robust priority engagement to ensure that 
man is wired to school okay. or on time. That, that, that one, it's, it's good to comply mm. with the circulars. And the reasons why they cannot comply with the circulars, mm. of course, are understood. But then that does not in any way affect. If I want to procure chemicals for laboratories, apparatus for laboratories, for the whole year, I tend at the end of the year. And, 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 and I get a supply. Who will be able to do it for the entire year? So really, and as when you receive mm. capitation, which is matched okay. against that particular tender, then you can make the payment. So, so, so what, <coughs> what, what happens here? C.S. Mashiro uh, yesterday said, uh, just a minute, Mashiro, that 23 billion shillings capitation has already been released, and uh, school heads will be able to access that money before uh, weekend. So the question is, so what are you going to do with the money? And schools are closing. Uh, what are they going to do with the money? Are they going to return it back to the exchequer? Or what's, what's happening? Uh, one, I, I don't want my colleague uh, Sosion to miss the point. Mm. When you are in your house, then you have option of buying a cloth and then uh, buying food. Mm. Uh, which one will you do first? You'll buy food. Mm -hmm. We know this capitation is structured. We know that it is maybe for tuition, it is for personal emolument. Mm -hmm. But while running a school, we also have something called environment. Yes. That if you do not have money for tuition, then you can use money for boarding uh -huh. to purchase things for tuition. So there is no school which can run without tuition money. Because that is where we buy chemicals, we buy books, we buy stationaries, we buy those things. Mm. Uh, basically, that is what is used to run schools. So if the money for tuition is not remitted, then the principals, through their boards of management, can do environment yes. so that they run the school. So we cannot say strictly that this money, when it is not paid, the school should be able to run. Mm. It cannot run. If we say that uh, personal emolument, that for paying workers, these are workers who are earning 15,000 shillings mm. per month, mm -hmm. then you have not paid them for three months, where do you want them to go? How do you want them to live? How will they deliver in schools mm. where they are employed? So what we are saying is that the, gov the seriousness we are talking about is that this capitation must come on time. And... I want also to refresh my, my brother here that last year, the whole of last year, the total capitation which was given to school was not more than 12,000. And that is the record we have. Mm -hmm. So it means that certain amounts of money were not remitted to schools. So it, it left a big gap. We cannot procure things for a whole year in this country now. Yeah. This is what brings pending bills. When you procure items for a whole year, then this capitation does not come. Who is going to pay in the next so financial how, year? How early should this be? As the schools begin, then we need to have capitation. We are now being told 23 billion is going to, is going to be released uh, uh, this week. Mm. Last week we were promised that within 10 days that money was going to be released before the schools close. I think those are mere statements for public gallery. We must be specific, we must be on a point, and we must do these things on a time. This money was supposed to be used on, in first term. 50% of this money was to be used on first term. Mm. When we talk about 23 billion, how has it been itemized? Is it the 50%? It can look big, but maybe it is just 3,000 per school. So we must come down and item as what we are talking about in terms of capitation to school. That is why I insist that this government mm. must take education seriously. Because without education, then we cannot do anything. So we must prioritize. Mm. We must give the first priority. If you are not educated, you will not be here. Absolutely. If you didn't go to school, my friend here, if you didn't go to school, you would not be here. Mm. He is putting his things in a manner suggesting that he has been to school. So why can't we give our kids the same education that we have? All right. No, I, I think uh, we are speaking the same thing, all of us. And uh, I think it, 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 it has reached a time we all apply our minds and our managerial capacity to education extremely seriously in terms of funding mm. we must have clear accountability and everybody must be accountable yes right from treasury right up to the ministry because you see when when you're talking about 
allocation of 22,000 per student. At what stage did it reduce to 17,000? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, where, where, where are you taking that 5,000? You must account for every shilling. You know, if we talk of accountability, mm. everybody must take responsibility from Treasury. Mm. No exception. Mm. Ministry of Education, no exception. The boards of management, no exception. And, and I'm appealing to members of parliament, because I've seen what they're doing. Personally, I've been in this space for long. When, when I see a model, like for example in Kiharu, mm. that schools have been organized, the member of parliament is able to involve himself in the budgeting, the cost of sustaining a student for the whole term, up to even the meal, very particular about the menu, the uniform, the resources. And that money is availed through the framework of the CDF. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it is done. Then it tells us that we have enough money. It is only how we are, how we are managing it. And I've seen very many constituencies replicate the same, eh? I, including even packaging money through bursaries. And, and households are only able to pay a thousand shillings mm. per student. Then this tells me we could be having sufficient resources, sufficient money for education, but we have not put in place proper public accountability structures. And I would, I would recommend that uh, education management and funding can be handled through constituency units, and we look at these models, and then we audit properly without giving anybody exception. The sector where there could be massive corruption, and I'm saying so because I've been, is education mm. and about this funding. When there are delays, when, when, when not all the money is sent, where, where, where do you take the rest of the money? Then if you take, for example, uh, if you reduce 200 shillings per student, and there are how many students in the Republic? 15 million. That translates to how many millions? Hmm? It's a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, I'll do my math. And then do, do we have, <laughs> do we have a, a school audit system that is working? It is, it is deliberately dismantled. It was dismantled over time yeah. so that schools are not audited. And I, I, in fact, I would say the school heads have not been put to full accountability processes that they are able also mm. to account and run schools efficient. Everything is vague from treasury to the ministry to schools and to the school audit unit, which is dead. I'm, I'm, <laughs> and, and I don't think this is how we are going to run education. Yeah. And we are not going to run it that way. And it cannot be run that way. So that then any money that comes to school should be put into proper use for the benefits of the learners. Mm. What are these lapses, these gaps that we are getting all through right up to, and it did not start yesterday. So that then the delay, what, what is it about this, the, these delays? Mm. Let, let the delay be because of lack of co collection of revenue, but not because of uh, some other fishy deals in the middle. Uh, number two, I've always insisted, we need a proper quality assurance and standards department that is operating, that is able to check schools, to complete with the auditors, and we are able to account to Kenyans how, how this money has been spent. But if we are on stories of all oh, schools are closing early because of delays, we engage in these funny games yeah. where it's very difficult to be accountable to Kenyans, we are not going to deliver equitable quality mm. education. Mm. For me, we need strong, clear accountability structures. Once we have those ones in place, then we talk of timely remittances and constant review of funding yes. models. But it cannot be the same but all the through. Look at the universities. Yes. The universities collapsed under the watch of a government for a long time because we had a wrong funding model. Mm. Universities were collapsed. Nobody was concerned. Mm -hmm. But now the new funding model that has been subjected to a lot of uh, professional and research work is going to work. It, it is uh, yeah. year one, it's, it's done. Year two, it will work. And we can see universities coming back to 
coming back to life. Wh why was it neglected? We cannot neglect mm. education to deteriorate because of poor administrative but labs. The, but the question is, and during, during formative yeah, stages yeah. of having this capitation, was there a clear roadmap on how this thing yes, was Yes, let me explain how it was if done. If so, because why do we have these hurdles right now? Let, let me explain how it was done. Yeah, we want to take a break. Yes, mm -hmm. before you take a break. Kindly. That is when Professor George Saitote was the Minister for Education. Okay. Uh, after I, after, I, I love after that part 2000 of history. I love that two part elections. Of history. And hold, that is hold. when the first government yes. money was wired to schools, and Thank particularly you. to hold, primary hold. schools I, I that even didn't have accounts. So, so but I'll give just you a narrative on yeah. that. When How, what was done? When, no, when we, when we come back. And where we delay. When we come back. You said 200 shillings times 15 million students. Million. That is... That is how much? 300 million. And that is why yeah. every cent of what billion. is declared... Oh, 3 billion. Yeah, it is 3, 3 billion. billion. Every cent of what is declared as three. capitation per child must be wired to the school account. Let's take a break. Not anywhere else. Let, 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 let's take a break. Let's take a break. We'll be right back with more. Was there a clear structure when this thing was at its formative stage? You've talked of Saitoti. And why we have... There, was, there, there were clear structures. Just and I'll tell you where it was directed. Someone has... I, and I, why? I'll come, I'll come back to that. Someone is also asking, then why the affordable housing? Why collect the money and then churn it to schools? Somebody just asked. A uh, very good question. That collect the money instead of affordable housing and then uplift the lives of schools. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that when you come back. Stay with us. <laughs> Hot potato. Channel One. We are a TV station like no other. Us. Get a taste of the best in entertainment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Feel the passion. Will you promise me? I swear that you will never lose me. I can't get married to you. I'm sure you knew about it. That's why you were making fun of me. Experience the drama. Get out. Who's the man in this one? Ah, wait. And the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Move to the beat. We are live from Broadcasting House and get informed on the latest happenings. <laughs> KBC Channel One. <laughs> We are the full package. Oh, yes. And Kenya's watching. Thank you very much for joining us. WRC Safari Rally traverses Kenyan terrain through five stages. A path with diverse challenges that test the cars and the drivers. Strength, resilience, toughness, gusto, speed, and willpower against all odds. We launch with the Kasarani Super Special on Thursday. Cruise through Element Titer on Saturday and beeline to Hell's Gate on Sunday where the winner will be crowned. Keep up with the daily news, highlights and competitors' interviews as we race to the top. 
This is the on KBC Channel One, your true sports partner. Welcome back. It's now a good breakfast. Of course, all of us have a cup of coffee, but it's real coffee. Uh, Bashmir Sosion, we are doing well. We are one of the best Palestatals. Yes, and you should be making money. Otherwise, you'll be wound up. No. Yeah? No, yeah. I refuse. You know, KBC, <laughs> let me say it while on set. I hear there was a change of management the other day. KBC. You brought yes. a new... <laughs> The, we, the, we are the, good. The infrastructure mm -hmm. that you have as KBC, <laughs> even if you combine all the media houses in East and Central Africa, we are the best. It cannot even be a quarter of you. So we you should the, give us the best. best. But uh, before we forget, you you asked yes what was there before? What was there in before? 2002 mm -hmm. at Nyeri DB Primary School when Mwai Kibaki attended. Kenya National Union of Teachers. 2002. Yes, uh, right. Nyeri Branch Annual General Meeting. Mm. We made an unwritten agreement with Mike Baki at that time about the future of education in Kenya. Mm. That two things he was going to do, pay teachers well and pay the pending salaries, which he did mm -hmm. between 2003 and 2006. Mm. And then two, finance education from primary one to eight. Mm. And he said, we collect our taxes, protect our taxes, and pay for every child. And true enough, when we elected him, because that was an unwritten agreement, the first money was wired to primary schools, yes. which initially did not have accounts. Mm -hmm. And you remember, before then, government was not putting any money mm. to schools. Mm. And what was the challenge? how to use this money and uh, how to budget what it was meant for where to purchase materials yeah because teachers and that are is flat -footed. and that is that is when the bookshops yeah. and Quebec said let us have booksellers and bookshops mm. to thrive also so mm. that they become entities of business and employ people mm. and and there were a lot of guidelines yes and we asked Quebec give us the best minister who can implement these programs. That's why we were given Saitot, a former vice president mm. and uh, a former finance minister, minister. as the minister <coughs> for education. It was deliberate because a lot of leadership was required in that sector. And so money was wired. And uh, the lot of engagement, meetings with the head teachers, with the school boards of management, with the school instructional mm. materials, uh, procurement teams, and, uh, and the money was subjected to auditing. And the first institution to conduct auditing of, of uh, free primary education money mm. was Price Waterhouse Coopers. Mm -hmm. And I think the standards were set on how to audit and must audit. And you must audit school to school how the money is spent and uh, audit to check that books are actually bought and delivered. And it worked for quite a while, for a long time. Yeah. But over time, cartels came in. These cartels over time have ensured that the auditing is not done. And Orero is here, he's a former principal, he can agree with me, that the auditing of schools, school by school, is no longer done as it should have been. And that is a tragedy, Victor. Mm -hmm. If government is wearing money and auditing is not properly done, then we are incurring losses. Then now these stories of allocation of 22,000 mm. per child, and you don't remit 22,000, you remit 17. But I'm sure Treasury 
in its budgeting, you know, we have been in parliament. Yeah. What is budgeted is actually allocated yeah. and paid. Yeah. So where is this discrepancy? Now, now that's the biggest question. Then the these other mischievous characters, and we saw the other day with the, with the release of exams, the USSD, that short message number that is procured, whoever created it was making about 100 million in a day when results are released. So there are a lot of flagships. Cartels came in and created okay. business, uh, business well. flagships. Now, uh, a, a lot of things came. And, and uh, I remember as Secretary General Nat, I refused. The nationalization of procurement of textbooks, that was wrong. Mm. It's taking away the democratic right of the teacher to choose the books and the materials mm -hmm. for the learners. And the right place for the teacher to choose is a bookshop. Yes. But some ministers, rogue ministers, came in and said, no, we are procuring national. So that vote is removed from the school allocation. Yeah. But it is still allocated within school. the 22,000. Mm. Now, so which means House, the schools do not have so that power Jogo to House yeah. started operating and executing functions of the boards mm -hmm. of Manage. management. Okay. We, we, which fundamentally is wrong. And th all these processes have been entrenched. And it, it, it will take a, a bold leadership to eliminate all that. According mm. to me, according to me, finally, according to me, what Saitoti established was dismantled over time. And it needs to be reinstated. Mm. Put money to schools. And let the board of management which represents the minister perform its role and let us have clear accountability structures in place let's have two entities working quality assurance currently, and every school currently, currently, must currently, be currently quality what's, assured currently what's happening that is currently what's happening nothing schools are not quality assured uh, schools are not okay no no, no 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 what, what, what we need to say mm. is that we need to strengthen the quality assurance department because we have a complete directorate yes. in the ministry of education theoretical for quality assurance so when we say we need to strengthen it means we need to put allocations in terms of resources mm. to the and quality personnel. and personnel resources personnel finances and all that mm. to this uh, unit we also say that the audit unit we are not saying that it they are completely not audited because that is not true, but we need to strengthen the audit unit yeah. within the Ministry of Education so that maybe the schools are regularly, maybe audited. timely audited. audited. And, and we, with the assistance of the quality assurance, then now we'll be able mm. to assess and see where we have gaps, and then we can fill in those gaps. So what we are saying is that um, the Ministry of Education mm. must go back to the drawing board and see why now we have these discrepancies in terms of monetary uh, delivery allocations to school yeah. and the capitation. He is saying that we go back to the site here. When I, I, I was there as a principal, you find that you are given books that you don't require in the school. You have those books. They have been procured nationally. By you somebody. You somebody, don't yes. You have the same books, mm. and many of them, many of them, you don't need them. But, and other schools don't even have those books. Yeah. And you must take those books. You keep them in the library, or you donate them to other schools. So we need to look at those kind of irregularities. Mm. We cannot procure books nationally and deliver to schools let the schools, let the schools do the boards of management as, as per their need yes, yes as per their need yeah. some schools don't even need those textbooks and as per the ILO UNESCO recommendation number mm. 60 part of the duties of the teacher is to choose learning resources democratically okay if, as a chemistry teacher I thought that uh, we share the same school. subject. Allah? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I taught chemistry at Nakuru High School. And uh, the best book I could use mm. was uh, KIE because of practicals and, uh, and uh, issues of results and, and also the, live, the entry behavior of learners. So smart. Mm -hmm. You perform practic practicals with them, and then when you get to discuss the results, they're exceptionally good. And of course, 
the laboratories were there. If you talk about lesbic condenser and separation of mixtures, every child would have a lesbic condenser. Mm. Uh, but when I went to teach in a day school, when I was posted, that was my teaching practice, there was no laboratory, there were no test tubes, and so I could not... The, the, the KIE chemistry book was irrelevant, so mm. I had to use pattern. So really, you cannot <laughs> use the same books for the different schools, different schools and different uh, types of learners. And that is why, democratically, and Kibaki agreed, that let the teachers go to the bookshops and choose the books for their yes. learners. And then you have the list of books approved by KIE in the orange book. Yes. So you choose. But you see, when Matiang and Magoa came and took away that thing, with an argument that uh, the government was going to save money. There was nothing like saving money. Mm. National procurement. Jogo cannot procure. In fact, nothing should be pro procured completely from Jogo and from any entity of the ministry and supply to schools. All procurement should be done at the school level. Mm. Let Alliance girls procure their equipment from their school accounts. Let every, you, you cannot be administering policy while implementing the, the same, same policy, policy in the same office in a manner that is never understood. And okay. that explains why some of the capitation is not reaching school. So if you hive off, say, for example, 5,000 per child, so 5,000 so per what child, will, what will happen to this money? Is, time is how many millions of yes. children? That was million, million, how many million? 15 million. That's coming to 3 billion. And so what that now is what happens the president to this money? Was um, about. Budgeting, I, for, budgeting for what? For corruption. That is pocket okay. money. Uh, because you manipulate. Uh, allow me to ask this question account. because we're, we're, we're winding up. So what happens to this money? If schools are closed right now, so what are, what, what are principals going to do with this money? Uh, quickly. Yes. Uh, of course, this money, just have, we have said that uh, they have procured goods uh, uh, without paying. So they have also pending bills. Uh, they have run schools without this money. So this money still will be used to pay if the, we have the suppliers for bringing either lab equipment mm. or school learning materials. Or in some cases, the, it is uh, paying for workers within institutions. You will realize that uh, some workers have not been paid for the last three months. Most schools have employed board of management teachers, BOM teachers, and they have not been paid. So we believe that... Um, a true environment. Mm. We believe that this money, when they get it now, if it is really 23 billion, we know that as the schools come back, they will be able to pay their suppliers the, to start from a good footing yes. and ensure that now they are at balance. But will they also give capitation for the second term? That's the question. Because this is for first term. We expect that as the schools open, the Ministry of Education should be able to give the capitation, which is 30% mm. in the next uh, term. So this 50% should have been for the last term. We expect that 30% should be brought for next term. So this money will not go to waste. We believe that the principal and board of management of those schools will efficiently and effectively use this money to pay for those uh, suppliers uh, that were not paid because of lack of capitation. All right. Yeah. Thank you. William Sassian, one, 10, 20 seconds. We're already out of time. Kendi. Yeah, so I think th this debate of delayed money is bigger than uh, w w what we think. I agree very strongly. Ministry and Treasury should agree and remit the money allocated on time. But on the flip side, mm. uh, we cannot say the quality assurance has been operating. I do challenge. Do we have a quality assurance report of every school, every time in Kenya, or even once in a year? The thing is, it died. Uh, school auditing. We cannot, we cannot say, yes, there's been auditing. And uh, this I'm talking from facts, and I have checked. It's, it's not being done. So these are two things that CS Machogo should concentrate on. Yeah. Without which, even you cannot talk about implementing CBC. Mm. How do you implement CBC mm -hmm. when you don't have a quality assurance to monitor and ensure that it is properly yeah. implemented? Those are the big gaps, mm. and we cannot pretend. So there must be a working, effective, quality 
assurance and standard department mm. that is able to generate a quality assurance and standard report for every school every time. Yes. And an audit unit that is able to audit every school every time and working with the boards of management. And then all the money must be wired to schools, retaining even a single cent. Timely. Either the treasury disbursement or funds. At, at Jogo is wrong. Wire all the money to schools and supervise the school's boards of management okay. to procure and ensure there's prudent management. Thank and you. then lastly, Thank you. can we devolve the funding and, uh, and development of schools and to, to, to constituencies and capacity build members of parliament so that then we can ensure that eventually that's, that's a, that's we a deliver for free education that's, that household that's an is and able to pay. That is another topic of discussion. It, thank you so much. It's an idea. That it's a big idea. We must so move much. forward you, all you, the time. You have an idea and to take some motion in parliament. <laughs> because we have seen, we have seen you, many constituencies you, yeah, 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 yeah. models have, yeah. that are freeing households pick, from pay. We should be able to pick that and run with it in parliament. I mean, yes. Yeah, that is... I will be willing to work with him in Kibra. You can see that really what the MPs do through the CDF yes. is uh, bigger than even these competitions yes. that are being right. injected in schools. Uh, we, we, we are past time. We are past oh, time. Okay, so Thank you so much. Uh, all of them are teachers today. So today we are talking about matters capitation at school. That is quite important. Schools are doing the exams and uh, sometimes later this week they'll be closing. The issue is about capitation. What should be done? Where did the rain start beating us? Okay, so Malimo Sosian, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, former NATSEC Gen, he's given us a bit of some history way back from uh, 2002 he's been there. And Molimu Pitorero, who was also a former principal and now member of parliament representing Kibera. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, Molimu Sosion, there's a question here for you, but this one you will answer next time when you come back here. You said you are a chemistry teacher. Chemistry teacher. Question number one. This one is your assignment. You will re answer this when you come back. Molimu Sosion, are you listening? You are a I'm student listening. now. Thank you. Question. Name a method that can be used to separate each of the following substances. Three marks. Name a method that can be used to separate each of the following substances. One, a mixture of petrol of and diesel. Mixture of petrol no, 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 no. Mixture of petrol and diesel. Two, kerosene and water. Three, lastly, food coloring ingredients in a sauce. Chromatography, <laughs> fractional uh -huh. distillation. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> now we can teach chemistry. And you thank you for watching. And allow me to come with the apparatus <laughs> and I demonstrate. Have a good morning. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you so much. Miscarriage, a heart-wrenching journey that affects millions across the globe. Here, we delve into the causes, risks, prevention, and more importantly, dealing with the aftermath of enduring this profound loss. Pregnancy loss through a miscarriage usually leaves an individual or a couple grappling with grief guilt and emptiness. Grace Njuguna is one such lady who together with her spouse faced a miscarriage during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Miscarriage is one of the traumatic experiences that I've gone through in life. Uh, it, even to start with, it is something that I would never wish any woman to go through it. Even my worst enemy, I would not wish them to go through it. Uh, it's traumatizing. Uh, it's painful. It's actually among my, my, that day is among the worst days of my life. The pregnancy journey was good from conception up to 20 weeks, so I was 20 weeks on that day. Even as Grace gives the account of her miscarriage, Dr. Agnes Wanjiko sheds light on the miscarriage and its major causes. The word miscarriage is, uh, is a term that is used commonly to refer to a pregnancy loss a spontaneous pregnancy loss that occurs before a baby or a fetus is viable. 
when we talk about photoviability, we are talking about a, a fetus who is who can survive if born at that particular time. Worldwide, the definition refers to a pregnancy which is lost before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Some of the signs that uh, one uh, can look out for if you have missed a period or if you have confirmed a pregnancy, any bleeding it could be a sign of a miscarriage. Any pain in the lower abdomen could be a sign of a miscarriage, backache, or even fever could be a sign of a miscarriage which is even getting an infection. And true to this, Grace experienced these symptoms and swung into action seeking all possible medical interventions. When I was going to work, I had some pains, some cramping, but then I thought it is, uh, it's normal in the first trimester. It is, uh, it is normal to, actually in the second trimester, it is normal to have the cramping, it is normal to have pains. When I talked to my friends who, are, who I shared with, because it had begun on Friday, the cramping was mild. But now on Saturday, it, it was an issue. It was now a concern. But people were telling me, and even some nurses that I talked to and some doctors, they were telling me it can be normal. But in case it, it increases, I go to the hospital. So when I went to work, I felt it is important that after work, uh, I go to the hospital. While I was going, I thought it is just like any other visit. Once these symptoms have manifested, is there a chance of saving that pregnancy? Dr. Agnes explains. Once a woman has confirmed that she's pregnant and she starts getting these symptoms of bleeding, for example, it doesn't always result into a, into a miscarriage. So if someone can go to the nearest uh, hospital or visit their, their healthcare profession, uh, then they can be able to detect if these are signs of an impending miscarriage or just a threatening, a threatened miscarriage. A threatened miscarriage is a miscarriage whereby there is that bleeding, yes, from the birth canal, but the pregnancy remains intact. That is a threatened miscarriage. And in that case, if you go to the hospital early, that pregnancy can be salvaged. And, uh, but some may not be mis may not be salvaged because if you have already started expelling the products of the pregnancy, then you, we call it inevitable and it may not be easy to salvage that pregnancy. Well, my spouse came and in a few, uh, the best couple, they also came and we agreed that we, we want to go to another hospital. When we asked that to the, we asked the doctor whether it is okay, we go, uh, the doctor said that we, she cannot allow us unless a gyna comes who will see me and allow me to go. Mm -hmm. Because to her, the way I was, actually, alikuwa naniambia, wewe utapata mtoto kwa gari, hata hutafika yu hospital. Among the risk factors that lead to miscarriage is age past miscarriages and genetic problems. We advise women to give birth early or to get to have children early mm -hmm. before that five years of age. And this is because over time it has been uh, identified that women over 35 years have got an increased risk of miscarriages as well as pregnancy complications. Other risk, risk factors uh, for miscarriage are like maternal conditions. Um, somebody could be having a chronic illness like hypertension which is not well controlled and that can lead to a miscarriage.
Kenya Broadcasting Corporation is Kenya's most trusted news and entertainment brand. Grow your business, acquire more clients, and reach new, diverse audiences by advertising with us. We connect brands to audiences that matter, driving results for brands and enhancing your current marketing strategies. We have packages for all needs and no product is too small for us. Contact us today and capitalize on our combined power of radio, TV, and digital platforms. KBC Connecting Kenyans. So my name is Lisa Christofferson. I am competing as a driver in this year's Talenta Hella All Ladies Rally Team. And uh, it's very, very exciting. My name is Lisa. And if you don't know what that stands for, it stands for Life is So Amazing. Yeah? So also remember the song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. Everything you do in life should make you stronger. Gain that experience that takes you to another level. I always believe life is like a book that has many chapters. And this is one of the chapters that we are experiencing. So follow me on my Instagram, Lisa underscore Christofferson, and you can be part of my journey. I would like you to follow me on this journey and uh, watch me live on KBC, guys. Tuta nana. Thank you for staying with us this is good morning kenya and you are right in time for women at the forefront where we bring to you women who are doing exemplary well in their field of interest and today i have with me damaris ndungwa damaris ndungwa is a certified hr practitioner and the executive director blue concepts africa welcome to the program Thank you very much. How are you doing this morning? Very, very well. And hello, Vivian. I'm really happy to be here in the mm. show today. It's a pleasure to host pleasure you. To. If we may begin first um, by you telling us more about um, executive, uh, no, uh, Blue Concepts, okay. Blue Concepts Africa. Okay, thank you very much. So allow me first to talk a bit about who I am. Okay. And uh, I'm really excited, first of all, to be here in this show and I want to say good morning, Kenya, because really this is a <laughs> greeting for this show. Yeah. Uh, my name is Damaris Ndungwa Peter, and I am an organization development, as you've said. Mm -hmm. uh, HR uh, or human resource is my profession, and I've spent over 16 years in doing organization development. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we here, you know, with Vivian, sort of sprinkle a bit of magic as we explore on what we do uh, as, as Damaris uh, with my team as well in Blue Concepts Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, um, and for the record, just for our viewers, I am your your neighborhood uh, culture catalyst or, or corporate culture transformation catalyst. This is a name that I'm fondly given by my colleagues in the industry that we work in. Mm -hmm. And so you ask uh, a bit about myself, um, organization development, a very broad construct, learning, popularly called also training. It mm -hmm. is a space I've been for quite some time. And recently, of course, I've explored uh, the space of green <coughs> HR management practices within the workplaces, which is something that I've found uh, really inspiring and uh, very beneficial for organization. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that, uh, that has inspired me is some experiences that I've I had as an employee and later in my career as, as, as a team leader, you know, that made me to take some resolve 
or and, and take a mission uh, as my mission to be able to drive and change organization from just a may you know very toxic disabling place to a world place where employees are looking forward to come to and that's what makes me wake up every day to be able to meet that gap within organization supporting mm -hmm. leaders as well to overcome that yeah. and uh, I've been here for 16 years now mm -hmm. yes <laughs> So you better have the knack of being able to, you know, uh, transform institutional challenges or gaps into opportunities for growth. Yeah. And um, just allow me to say this because I find this a lot uh, when you talk about organization development as a title or a learning a consultant as a title. They're not your usual kind of job titles, you know, <laughs> they're not very usual ones. Yeah. But one thing I can tell you for sure is uh, most of the challenges that we face in our workplaces the issues that employees go through, uh, be it uh, ineffective leadership, a supervisor not supporting you, or even a very diminishing levels of meaningful engagement with work at the workplace, to bad experience for both employees and customers. Look mm -hmm. at that. All that is in the construct of organizational development. Mm -hmm. How do we move that? We have to learn new skills, new ways of doing things. That's why learning is quite an experience uh, that I, I really love. Okay. Uh, but this cannot exist in isolation we need structures we need processes to be able to reinforce that so hr also comes handy in that space and uh, yeah that's what i've been doing mm -hmm. for for my 16 years All but right. damaris is not about mm -hmm work mm -hmm. of course i have my other side of, of of work because we both juggle many things and um i am passionate about mentorship why you may ask because i am a product of mentorship Every word, everybody who crossed my line when I was younger in my career, you know, that built me and influenced my decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I support platforms that also mentor young people, be it in high schools or even new entrants in the market mm -hmm. or in the workplace, to mm -hmm. hold hands and so they can navigate a little bit faster. I also support within my team to build forums that uh, drive conversations that influence uh, a large scope kind of decision and uh, policies so we run national nationwide a bit of almost four forums right now mm -hmm. that drive different conversations uh, in the space be it leadership be it accountability be it corporate culture secondly I mentioned about green agenda also within the workplace we have a forum currently that we drive once in a year mm -hmm. that does that and mm -hmm. thirdly uh, we have a forum that brings HR leaders uh, into a platform with CEO or leaders within the industry uh, to be able to converse so now they can collaborate better to drive success for organization. Oh yes, right. and I'm a mother and a wife, mm -hmm. of course, of two young kids, uh, citizens as well. All right, you yes. are a lot of things. <laughs> that <That's laughs> introduction has been That's quite uh, long, yeah, yeah, and I love it. Thank you um, very much. You mentioned that most of your colleagues refer to you as a culture catalyst. Yes. Why is that? Um, I, I'll probably talk about my journey uh, in my career and how I ended up there. Mm -hmm. And I believe, and I've come to believe, uh, my career is more so just like most of the people who we grew and born in the same generation. Please don't ask me which generation <laughs> is that. Mm -hmm. But we grew up being told what to be. Yes, like, what do you want to be, Vivian, mm -hmm. when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And that kind of influenced uh, uh, the, the kind of prestigious titles we wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And that influenced also uh, how we approached, of course, learning in school. Mm -hmm. And so I pick it. I go into high school uh, with that kind of mindset. And guess what? I even pick all the sciences. Yeah, you want to win eh? mm -hmm. <laughs> and be one of those careers. Uh, so we talk about the biology. Most people don't like science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were even told it's not for girls, eh? but I still went for them. The chemistry, all the biology. We even had computer science, mm -hmm. you know, high school. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I do that. Why? Because I, I really want to be kind of belong in, in that. I, I think after some time, I realized it wasn't sort of conscious, but because it's this thing that driving you to be that thing that people want to see. Mm -hmm. And of course, I exiled, got a number of airs in those sciences. I end up in the university, and uh, in the university, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know whether you belong to where there was an institution called JAB. Mm -hmm. JAB, JAB, the one that used to place uh, students yeah. to universities. So mm -hmm. Of course, used to place you somewhere. Sometimes you get surprised where you went there. Mm. So I was one of those culprits. 
I ended up in a, in a university, a campus that was purely education. I was aiming to do information technology. Oops. Yeah, it was that deep for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many efforts, of course, you go to do something to get where you want to be, but they, they were not yielding. So I met the registrar dean of that in, uh, campus. In fact, it's the one who chose the subject. So it's, uh, I think this is what you can do <laughs> here to be beneficial. So I ended up doing economics and mathematics, and there began my career. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I finished uh, my career, those are four years, uh, commonly in Kenya public university and I liked the experience of you know teaching the pedagogy the science of being able to impart knowledge mm -hmm. and see people transforming to something bigger it was very exciting mm -hmm. except something happened that I was left me wondering whether I really want to go there you know there are this placement into schools and then I ended up in a conversation you know the, the it's called the staff room mm -hmm. the staff room and then, this thing is not putting some good wind under my wings, okay. challenging more enough. So I went to another school, I'm like, Allah, this, this is not kind of the challenge I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So that sort of opened my mind to, to bigger, bigger space than mm -hmm. just education. So I landed um, in a college. College was a bit bigger because I thought, eh, hey, about adult learning, mm. and maybe things would be different. It was a startup, and you know, a startup you do everything like you are expert of many things. Mm -hmm. It was a good experience for me, uh, which I stayed there for about a year or so. Went into one of the leading banks, of course, entry level was a contract. I also learned a lot on how banks operate, meeting new people, being able to communicate. And my career sort of strongly began in my third kind of uh, a job, mm -hmm. which was in a learning institution. Those years used to be a training institution. Yeah. So I go in as an associate trainer. A trainer is a person who facilitates these initiatives, organizations. Mm -hmm. And wow, it was quite an amazing space for me because you're meeting people, which is different from teaching. Because teaching, you are the authority, you are the knowledge itself. Mm -hmm. To, to, to training, which is very different because uh, you facilitate the knowledge. You know, not necessarily the authority, because yeah. you may have participants, they are quite experienced. So you make use of what is in that space to create something bigger, which is different. And that was quite interesting because mm -hmm. you get to learn from big as well as being the trainer of the big, which mm -hmm. is kind of very exciting as well. So you meet who in who, but you have to ace your thing. So I thought this is it. Um, I hadn't even known what training is all about. I just found myself in a space. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I transitioned to full time, and I came in as a, a research assistant. So this is what we're doing, being able to study gaps within institutions that are making them more inefficient and you know, moving with the next team to develop solutions for them, which is ideally what I came to learn is learning and development and organization development years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we go into it. I rem now I measured my degree. I did mathematics and economics. So statistics is coming handy there for us uh, and for me. So I'm helping and contributing and it's becoming something really good for me. So I go yeah. in, we're churning more solutions and my next department could actually roll out the solutions the market. Mm. So this made me to be pushed to that level of where I go into business development to be able to help that space. And this was a war space, very different. You are now meeting and facing the decision makers in organization to show them how this is going to be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. So I get to meet uh, different ranks of people in organization, both in government, in private sector, multinationals, nationals, and all that was a whole wave of and shift in my career. And therefore, I face for the first time an organ, which is an organization. Mm -hmm. It's like we have leaders making decisions. We have structures with that control, with us control and span of influence for power. We have people who are contributing in certain goals. We have a strategy, you know, these things that make an organization. And we are supposed to identify these gaps within this organ. And I'm like, wow, now this one means I have to scale up myself. Mm -hmm. So what is this thing? So I ended up doing human resource because this is a game of people. Yeah. So I go in and uh, shift in education to human resource. I yeah. transition to a yeah. different career. Uh, and this was just uh, very rapid uh, and sort of driven, demand driven. So I ended up in human resource. I get my certification in human resource in suit. <coughs> I'm practicing in it. And that gave me a mileage, let me say, because now with the skills, competence, and capacity, I'm able to face a bigger, bigger scale mm -hmm. of business. And all of a sudden, I've grown 
to the person that is a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And um, we are maybe going for, for um, yes. sorry for interrupting, yes. but for someone who is looking to transition, mm -hmm. you know, ma making a shift yes. in their career. I mean, from your story, you've been shifting mm -hmm. all along. You find challenges to, you know, to conquer all along. So exactly. it forced you to shift. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's looking to make a shift in their career, but they're not sure, because I... I don't know, but I believe it's scary. You know, yeah. you're used to doing this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're comfortable. It is what you do on a daily. But mm -hmm. now you feel like you need to do better. You need exactly. to change to <coughs> something else. Mm -hmm. what, what would you advise them? Wow, for... I mean, these people tell me, oh, I am in catering, I'm in tourism, and I feel my heart is in HR. Uh, you know, you meet those people who feel like, oh, my goodness, I think... Uh, you remember the story of being... Uh, so you pursued a career simply because your mom or dad really mm. inspired you, then you realize, Allah, this is not it. Mm -hmm. um, one first thing I usually tell my mentees is, is it really, really, really what you want? Because you really have to be sure whether when we say this, my, where, where my heart is, is actually where it is. Because it is quite an investment that's going to take you some transition in period and things you need to do mm -hmm. that will take you time. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that for nothing. So ask them, d find out, go deep, ask, talk to people, ask for feedback. Uh, observe yourself in, in this space so you make a definitive kind of a decision. That's mm -hmm. the first place. Mm -hmm. Have uh, an intent. Have a, an intent that you really feel, this is me. I belong here and there are many ways you can tell you can assess yourself to know this is where I come alive so after you're sure this is it then you go to draw a plan mm -hmm. by the way I forgot to mention that I'm a very structured person <laughs> as for my personality so I'll mention plans a lot <laughs> <laughs> you're so allowed. you you make you make a plan mm -hmm. and in this plan you what is it what, what does that growth look for like for you mm -hmm. you define it for yourself uh, this is what I think being, um, let me use my career in human resource, what I want to see myself in human resource. Mm -hmm. This is the competence I want to build in human resource. This is the timelines I have to be able to achieve ABCD for me to get there. Where am I going to get the resources from? Do I need someone to help me in this journey? Mm -hmm. You put those things crystal clear for yourself. That's in a plan. That gives you the leverage to be able to look at the old scope and know where to begin. Um, do you need someone to help you navigate? That's where mentors also come in handy to hold your hand to transition. It's not easy when you have finished college or your study and gone into a career for five good years and you realize in your system is not working. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And I tell you why. I know you've been in media for long. You can imagine someone telling you, you stop calling yourself an anchor or whatever. Who are you? You sort of lose your identity. That's and that's not easy for people. Yeah. So when you want to draw this distinction, you have to accept some things. Because people you finished with are, of course, maybe entering mid management. Mm -hmm. For you to transition, you know, you have to begin the career somewhere lower, most likely, if it's not a transferable skill kind of a career, mm -hmm. uh, for you to build up yourself. So you have got to understand some, some things are going to happen. They are going to be comfortable for you. So you learn to accept them as yourself. Then uh, thirdly is, you know, look for people. I think I've mentioned that toward your hand to show you the shortcuts mm -hmm. because that's the use of coaching and mentorship. For, for, so they will tell you how to move first, who, where do you need to go so you can sort of navigate faster. Mm -hmm. So invest in mentors, invest in coaching, invest in someone to guide you in your career plan. And one thing I insist, go do the job. Some people will think like, uh, because I'm talking to Vivian, you, you can actually connect me faster. It mm -hmm. doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You have to go do your job. Yeah. You go do the competencies, the skills you need to have. You've got to tick those boxes and clear yourself before uh, Vivian is able to say, yeah, I think you're ready. You've got to prepare yourself for, for, for the transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, be easy. Everything good takes time. And uh, of course, the last, the last one I'll say is build a network. Build a network is going to be the biggest investment for yourself. It has worked for everyone, including myself. Mm -hmm. People who will easily hold your hand, who will tell, point you to the right table that you might have taken two or three years even to get at. So be intentional. 
on investing on relationship, uh, offering value because again the game of building network is quite confused by many people. Mm -hmm. You've got to offer value for you to get connection with people who will value what you do or what you're building and then they will get you there. I, I like giving those uh, five pointers because you will have to navigate on each one of them. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is inside. You've got to fire yourself mm -hmm. to get up on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I guess sometimes you're lucky because some people like us never got to know those things. Uh, I think it's by grace of God <laughs> that we somehow had to navigate uh, by luck of finding some people on the way. And incidentally, um, you know, I spoke about hitting a ceiling at some point in my career. Mm -hmm. And now you think you need to make some hard decisions because at that point I had to make some hard decisions. I've invested on myself growing bigger, but I can't see. Uh, the other day I was watching a, a clip of uh, some people racing and there was a baby mm -hmm. and they had labeled themselves. So one of them was economic, uh, economic situation, economic something. Yeah. The baby was salary, and the other guy can't remember. Mm. So when the, the, the gun went, the baby was left there, still mm -hmm. down there. So everything is shooting <laughs> up, exactly. but your salary remains. <laughs> it's remaining the same. Yeah. So in such a situation, mm -hmm. uh, y you know, you know, you find yourself. You got to make decisions. It's not about transitions only. Uh, so I had to make hard decisions. And then, where, where did I have a place to go? By the way, incidentally, I didn't have a place. I'm saying I'm leaving to go. Mm. I just knew this one is not working for me. I've got to disrupt myself. And that's how I ended in Blue Concepts Africa, a big space. It was a startup, though, mm. uh, but uh, you know the struggle of starting up a company. But it was huge space for me to grow, which also I got in and we're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. And uh, we've uh, since specialized in a lot of, uh, you know, programs that are helping organizations to unlock their potential, to be able to build cultures that are working for their people mm -hmm. and for them as well. Um, and, and, and a lot of uh, programming that are quite sufficient for oh. all the individuals that we've been running for the last over eight years. All right. Yes. Now, what are some of the challenges that you would say you've faced, you know, in your scaling up mm -hmm. to get to the point that you are right now? And yeah. how are you able to just overcome, overcome them? Okay. When I was young, I used to hear stories about uh, gender, women. You know, mm. when you're young, you kind of can't connect. Mm -hmm. But you come up in the career and you face things, you're like, wow, I didn't know that can actually happen. Is it because of this? So Let me tell you something, by the way, about myself. Mm -hmm. um, I have been quite petite, but it's small in size. I'm a bit short also. <laughs> so I didn't have some, some kilos like I have today. In fact, my friend, uh, Jen Mutisia, let me mention her the other day, told me, you've gained weight, I'm getting worried. I'm like, is it a good worry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so you imagine um, right now, like I was at the helm of leadership or business development for the company, moving to Blue Concepts as a CEO. Mm -hmm. um, people incidentally say my voice is a bit bigger, if you don't know until you come. So I enter in, uh, enter in some boardrooms and they're like still looking and waiting for Damaris. Yeah, who Have you ever had? <laughs> <laughs> they're still waiting for the Damaris to come. Eh? Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges I've had to navigate is, is this issue of gender and stereotyping. Mm. So you go in there, they see it's like a girl, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they start questioning your competency, your capability, your capacity. Mm. And for all that, that really puts a long car for yourself because now you really have to prove whether you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, I don't think, is a Damaris story alone. It is something I found that commonly happens for, for, for women. In, in the space, especially this one in my work, I found it in the spaces where predominantly is men mm -hmm. in these careers. Yeah. So uh, something happens in that space. Uh, is it something that we can't overcome? Yeah, we do. We do have to overcome because growth is something we have to pursue all the time. And one of the things I have really found myself is you've got to be ready. I mean, they say knowledge is, is power. So you're aware of what's likely going to happen, prepare for it. Mm. So one of the things I've learned over time uh, in those early years of my career is to be able to uh, prepare adequately and anticipate it, even where it's not predominant. People mm -hmm. are different. We are all diverse. So preparation uh, makes you articulate the solution and uh, convince that you can actually deliver. And when you get the opportunity to deliver, wow well then. 
do a thorough good job. I mean, like again, I say, do the job, so that when you finish, there'll be your advocate. Mm -hmm. There'll be the people who will be saying, you need this. Look for Vivian. Mm -hmm. you, you literally turn the tables for yourself. Mm -hmm. However, it takes work to work on yourself because it, it's also very hard to hear someone saying, uh, are you sure you can do this? Yeah. Uh, how will you do this? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're beginning or you're a beginner, it can hit you hard. So it, it's something just to be ready for. That's one of the challenges. Mm -hmm. Number two is something we call imposter syndrome. Yes. I know you've had I actually a <laughs> had a question on imposter syndrome. <laughs> go, go yeah, ahead. yeah, go imposter ahead. syndrome. You know, we have that uh, doubt voice voice of doubt yeah, that uh, tells you yeah, that yeah. As, do you really belong yeah, do you yeah, really exactly. think you belong uh, you, in this position you suddenly feel like uh, a fraud yeah <laughs> yeah so you go in some tables and you see people uh, talking stuff uh, at a certain level and all of a sudden there's a that voice telling you Allah uh, are you sure this is where you belong mm. so that that I used to have a lot of that some time back and I guess um, how does one overcome imposter syndrome because I feel mm -hmm. like at some point I know for me sometimes uh -huh. it just comes exactly. and I doubt myself uh -huh. you know so how how do you go about overcoming that and of, uh, and shutting it down completely I, I, I would say uh, I used to ask yourself is it something like you can overcome for real overcome or different <laughs> It's like, it's like a, a spirit that scales up with you. Yeah, as you move to the next level, that voice is still there. So you mm. just have to build a coping mechanism. Is it out of fear? Uh -huh. Where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the way we have been brought up yeah. um, to imagine some things uh, don't belong to ideally us. Mm. Uh, they are more of other people, you know, that kind of a narrative. Mm -hmm. So you grow from a space that you feel it's more, then you see yourself a lot. Is it me? And you're doing things and you're attracting the attention mm. and you're dropping impact. Uh, you know, you want to pause. It's like you surprise yourself. Mm. So you, you, you will get that voice. Will I make it? Will I yeah. even have the right conversation on that table? It's always there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, us, it's, it's upon us now to, to know which now that you're in media, which, which uh, station or frequency are you going to listen to? Mm. So you build a capacity continuously. The truth is I've realized that it's not something that will go away. You just build a capacity to be able to, 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 to cope with it or to mm -hmm. deal with it over time. Mm -hmm. So what you tell yourself when uh, you move in a space as a lady and you're being uh, sort of intimidated, mm. you run that frequency of, oh, gosh, uh, here we go now. Uh, I knew it wouldn't work. I mean, it wouldn't work. So what do you yeah. do? You Whatever switch, you believe it is. You switch the situation, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the frequency, have a powerful conversation with yourself. And the beauty is there are mechanisms, so now you can do that. Uh, you really just run the routine that works for you and, yeah, put a cut up and you're right there on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about imposter syndrome. Yeah. I want to mention uh, last of the cha challenges that I used to, mm -hmm. to have at my, my, my later my later uh, earlier career yeah. besides imposter syndrome and this stereotype you know um, sometimes uh, you you grow then you start to begin but you you must start your thing I don't know whether you see those ones mm -hmm. so you think I'm ready I'm ever ready I mean wait for it mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you know it, it's a delusion kind of a thing you're never ready for anything mm. so that kind of challenge uh, I've been in OD for 15 years mm. you know so I remembered uh, that used to be a challenge I mean you just call me uh, come and observe your organization I'll quickly tell you then I sort of was disrupted by one of my mentors and told me do you know needs are evolving you get hit hard on realities and that one that's how I overcome that issue of just imagining mm -hmm. you've been here for 15 years yeah. my friend you go to keep on disrupting so uh, that's how I sort of went that through that challenge and they can be quite many uh, especially for young people and for uh, you know women as well but as well for men mm -hmm. all their challenges the beauty yeah. is you just uh, understand challenges are part of success if you are not making an error you're not making a mistake or experiencing a challenge you are like you're not and growing you're not moving you're not growing you're not moving exactly. i love that yes. now as we almost uh, as we come to a close because yes. we should be winding up yes um i want you to mention maybe mm -hmm. very fast yes. on how one should go about picking their mentor as you give us your parting shots um okay 
Thank you very much. Um, in, the, in the shortest of words. In the shortest. <laughs> okay, picking a mentor. Yeah. Uh, first of all, people, people don't find it easy to pick a mentor because sometimes you think the mentor you want, I don't know them, but I admire what they do. Mm. <laughs> there are different ways you can be mentored. Some is very uh, passive. I have so many passive mentors. I follow what they do, I listen to what they say, and from there I pick lessons. Mm -hmm. So you're not limited to one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of mentorship. You can mm. follow people, pick lessons, and, and, and you map them to your own uh, life. Uh, if you want a real mentor, first of all, if you know them, you know, gather the confidence. Uh, there are many people out there who are willing to mentor you. Incidentally, you'll be shocked if you think they won't, and they'll be happy to. So gather your confidence, uh, make a call, have a meeting with them, tell them all you admire about them and what you want them to help you with. Mm -hmm. Secondly is if you want someone you don't know them, find the second person who will know them to introduce you to that mentor. And most importantly, and this is a perception about mentorship that I find is uh, nobody's gonna do your work. Mm -hmm. Don't go there with the mindset that I'll do your work because some people show up with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be able to be supported. People are busy, so but they will still have time to do that. All right. uh, okay, parting shot? Yeah. Yes. Um, I tell people your number one power is when you come to be alive on what is your, your strength. In other words, you know who you are very fast, invest on self-awareness so you know what your leverage points are and then you don't leverage on your weak points. So know yourself because I always say that you are you and that's your power. I love that. Thank and you. And we'll end it on that note. Thanks you are right. you and that is your power. There's no other person like you. This is where we end this particular conversation. I believe that you have been inspired uh, from the conversation that I'm um, just from having with Damaris. Don't you go too far. Mike Megwe is coming up next with more of Good Morning Kenya. KPC Channel 1 imeanda vipindi speciali katika mwezi mtukufu wa Ramadhan mwaka huu kwa ajili yako. Allahu Akbar. Asalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kando na ukumbi wa Kiislamu na hutuba ya Ijumaa kutakuwa na makala yanayoangazia maswala ya funga, mawaidha. Whoever witnesses the month of Ramadhan then he should fast. Vipindi vya mapishi katika mapishi ya Ramadhan tutatayarisha pilau ya korosho utahitaji viazi vitungu vinne vikubwa na zabibu na kaswida mbali mbali Ramadhan kana pia tumekuandalia kalenda ya Ramadhan ili kukuweka kwenye mstari wa mbele katika funga yako tazama runinga ya KBC Channel 1 katika mwezi huu mtukufu wa Ramadhan ili kukuza na kuhifadhi imani yako When I was all alone in this world, I mean, I never find any spiritual sustenance. When I was even the helpless to understand the meaning of life, even the meaning of despair was beyond me. Three years ago, you gave me the peace and peace of mind. Otherwise, there will never be another one. Those who have been killed by the police, they all suddenly change. Is it because they have encountered foreign foreigners? Foreign? 啊，有没有可能他们是在跟邻居联系，然后信号不小心被我们收到了？这个信号如此之强。You should have looked for me. Why didn't you look for me? Why would I? Was it because you found out that there had been something between Marcelo and my mother? Do you really think your mother would be capable of doing that? He knows about you, and you know him already. He's the man who came looking for me the other night and refused to leave his name. No. He's come to Ligia's apartment right away, sir. Why? She's dead. Differently. <laughs> 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 
every year we have a theme for it at different years. The first three years we were advocating for peace and unity. In recent years, we have decided to change the theme because we have seen that there's a lot of issues that are affecting persons with disabilities. Our mission is to provide positive, lasting change in their lives. When you go out there, disability is not an ability. You can try to get rid of it and you can get rid of it. If you look at the house, you can get rid of it, but if you look at the house, you can spread love. So I say, keep love alive. Differently. Welcome back to Good Morning Kenya. My name is Mike Meguer. Now we shift gears and talk about devolution opportunities, challenges, and the role of citizen in all this. And to help me uh, with this conversation in studio, I'm joined by Chris Owala of Community Initiative Action Group Kenya. Karibu sana to the studio. Santa Mike. How are you doing this I'm morning? I'm fine, Mike. Yes. yes. Now, to start off, I would love to know what or how community initiative groups support um, or how they contribute to the whole aspect of understanding devolution at the grassroots level. Mm. Thanks, Mike. I think uh, our work is uh, cut for us. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as civil society organizations, we have been working in a different framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as community initiative, we have been working with uh, under the what we call the Kenya Civil Society Devolution Working Group, mm -hmm. which is a group that is trying to look at how do citizens participate mm -hmm. in devolution? Mm -hmm. Because we have learned that, uh, yes, there are, there are a lot of resources now mm -hmm. that are coming down at lower levels, mm -hmm. but citizen life are not changing. Mm -hmm. So we are saying that, yes, uh, how do we make sure that citizens are at the core mm -hmm. in the planning, implementation, and the whole process of, uh, of development at the devolution mm -hmm. at the county level, which means localizing development. And uh, in the, in, if you have to localize development, it means that uh, we must fund the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and these have not been happening mm -hmm. in the recent past. Mm -hmm. You realize that uh, we throw money. The money, how we invest it, is not in how it's supposed to ch bring the change we desire. Because mm -hmm. we are at the onset, you know, at, in, at the independence, when we got independence in 1963, we had a majimbo, something akin to what we have in the present day devolution. Mm -hmm. And the majimbo system means that uh, regions have got their own government, mm -hmm. uh, their own legislation. But now we, uh, we have uh, uh, counties, which are 47 counties. Mm -hmm. And all these 47 counties are distinct and independent. Mm -hmm. But they still, they link to the national government because we realize the county generate their, their resources, but also they get money from national government. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the 47 counties, mm -hmm. they are all operating at different levels. Mm -hmm. And these levels depend on the goodwill, depend on plans of each counties. Mm -hmm. And uh, citizens are saying they are not uh, feeling it the way they're supposed to feel devolution. Uh, how then are they supposed to mm. participate in all this to ensure that whatever devolution is bringing to them meets their needs? You know, first the role of the citizens to elect their leaders. Uh -huh. You know, when they participate in election, mm -hmm. they must also make sure that the people they elect are the people that can help them deliver what they want. Mm -hmm. That's first. Sovereignty of the people under Article 1. Mm -hmm. Two people participate by designing or proposing the projects that they desire to be undertaken by the government. Mm -hmm. Three, they participate by paying taxes mm -hmm. to this government. Mm -hmm. Four, they participate by monitoring on how their taxes are utilized. 
uh, and also making sure that uh, legislation that are enacted are legislation that are relevant to their needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is the, the whole thing is about the people, it's about the citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, for devolution to be, to deliver effectively, mm -hmm. citizen must first understand their role, yes. and the, in the endeavor to get their, to understand their roles, which means the government, both national government and the county government, must do what's called civic education, so that citizen can continuously understand what is expected of them. Mm -hmm. And there's a gap in that. Mm -hmm. yes. So far, how would you say devolution has fared since its, uh, its in, uh, inception? Devolution has fared not good, uh, but it's the best thing that ever, has ever happened to this republic. Mm -hmm. But the, in terms of performance, uh, we could say it could be below average. Mm -hmm because uh, resources are there at the counties, but the if you look at the general report, mm -hmm. then it tells you why I'm saying so. Because mm -hmm. you realize a lot of the counties still get adverse opinion. Mm -hmm. Adverse opinion means that uh, the way you have used money mm -hmm. cannot comply, does not comply to the standard, which means the, the money, how you use the money is questionable. Yes. Uh, if you look at the budget controller's report each year, yes. Uh, they are done every quarter. That also is, is, a, is an indication mm -hmm. that uh, we are not using public resources well as people in the authority. Uh, yes, there are some delays at the national government, but the one, the little that comes, uh, that, the li that comes to the counties mm -hmm. are not used. They are used to, to such, to, to st I think they're used to, for personal enrichment, uh, for welfare, for recurrent more, and for, for, for financing people's lifetime, mm -hmm. as opposed to the money we have, as opposed to uh, investing in healthcare, for example, mm -hmm. helping, help investing in proper roads, mm -hmm. investing in water, quality water for the people, mm -hmm. investing in food security for the people. A lot of money, are going in the individual pocket. That's why in the, we have more people, more millionaires in the counties and more poor people. Less, less, fewer millionaires and more poor people still. Mm -hmm. But it could be the other way around. Yes. We could have had seen more people coming out of poverty bracket and uh, having lifestyle changes and economy of the co those counties changes. And you could see that many people are coming out of poverty bracket mm -hmm. but you see people are going down deeper every day uh, how can they how can that be addressed now you know there are many ways one is that we must work stop corruption we must make sure that uh, we we seal the loopholes of corruption mm -hmm. we must make sure that we follow how resources are utilized to make sure that the resources are used to benefit the people the, the ways that are supposed to benefit the people mm -hmm. we must make sure that citizens are the core Mm -hmm. to tracking how, the, how their money mm -hmm. is used. I, is there enough public participation? And if there's enough, uh, mm -hmm. and if there is public participation, is it done in a manner that is satisfactory in the sense that it is done in some areas, in uh, some areas, or some areas are favored when it comes mm -hmm. to public participation mm -hmm. than others? You know, the, the issue of public participation has been a big issue. One, people cannot participate, Mike, if they don't know where, wh what and how they are participating. Mm -hmm. People will never participate if they don't have information. So the public participation first must, for, for effective public participation to happen, first you must do civic education. Mm -hmm. Two, you must provide information mm -hmm. to the citizen. Mm -hmm. Three, you must give them the information in the language they understand. Mm -hmm. Four, you must give them information in a timely manner mm -hmm. that they will be able to interrogate mm -hmm. and make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. But then for there must be a law mm -hmm. regulating and how they participate. Yes. But five, which is critical, mm -hmm. there must be a process for feedback mechanism. Yes. You know why people don't participate? Mm -hmm. You go to a budget this year, you have raised your concern. Mm -hmm. You say we need a, a cattle dip, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. You come next year, 
you raise that part that we needed a road. Mm -hmm. You come again in the third year, you say we needed a, a, a let's say, a, a ACD school. Mm -hmm. But you realize all this time, all your issues are never going to find their way into the budget. Mm -hmm. What motivates you to come in the budget next fourth year? Mm -hmm. There's no motivation. Yes. So which means you are taken for granted. Yes. Even in the laws that we make, mm -hmm. even if you look at finance bill, which determine how citizens are taxed mm -hmm. and how uh, counties uh, generate their revenue, you realize that uh, the government just decide. Mm -hmm. And even whatever you say, they don't care at county levels also. So you realize that citizens are on their own. Mm -hmm. Uh, people, government is doing their own thing, mm -hmm. and citizens don't influence what goes into those yes. documents, mm -hmm. be it legislation, be it budget. Mm -hmm. The public participation has remained a token. You are ticking a box that we went, mm -hmm. but to what extent citizens have influenced mm -hmm. that process? You now, if, 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 if you talk about community uh, mm -hmm. initiative action groups, mm -hmm. Uh, what is uh, their impact in terms of promoting transparency and uh, reducing corruption in, in, in as far as devolution is concerned? Uh, the impact is there because I think uh, some of the things we do, we do, we go to court. Uh -huh. We litigate where there are, there, are, there are gaps when the government don't do, or for example, if you go to Public Finance uh, Act, which requires for any taxation measures or any uh, laws to be passed, the citizen must be involved. Mm -hmm. In those where gaps where the, the proper appropriate issues are never done, mm -hmm. we litigate. Two, mm -hmm. we engage with the institutions that are mandated to oversight counties. Mm -hmm. Like our Office Auditor General is supposed to promote what mm -hmm. you call citizen's audit mm -hmm. or scorecard. Mm -hmm. And we work with them also to help them identify Projects that has got high wastage, project that got uh, got high level of corruption. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the budget control office, we share with them, we raise with them through petition, through letters, to bring them to the attention areas that are not happening, what is not happening right, yeah. so that uh, when they do their report, mm -hmm. those areas the county are put to account. Mm -hmm. uh, we also build the capacity of the citizen. Because we feel that citizens must have the understand that they, they must undergo a certain pain mm -hmm. for them to gain. Mm -hmm. Gain never comes with, without a pain. Mm -hmm. So we say, yes, this is your resources, mm -hmm. this is your tax, mm -hmm. and uh, for you to make sure that uh, you benefit from it, mm -hmm. you must go a certain pain. That, for example, you must wake up at four to monitor something that's happening. You must make sure that the road is being done. You understand the BQ yes. so that you see it's not just opening the road, yes. but it's opening, gra grading, and, 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 and culverting. Yes. Yes. So that when the right work is done, mm -hmm. you could say this is the right work is done. If not the right work is done, mm -hmm. so that we get the value for money. Because mm -hmm. most of the time, citizens are laid back. Mm -hmm. Because one, the, the devolution has been bothered by, boxed by uh, clanism, yes. nepotism, yes. brotherhood, so mm -hmm. that when uh, the MCA, the governor from your clan, you feel that, oh, I, if I put them to account, it's like I'm fighting with my own clan. Mm -hmm. If I put them to account, the other clan will see me, I'm fighting them. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that uh, are, are, are weighing citizens down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even those public participation that at times happen, mm -hmm. they're not done in a proper way because mm -hmm. an old man that has a, got a, or a young person mm -hmm. or a person like me who at times have difficulties in reading small font, if you don't give me a document in the right font, mm -hmm. I might not participate because mm -hmm. I will not have read it. Yes. So if we don't plan a meeting where people with disability can access with ease, mm. they will not have participate. If you plan a meeting without sign language interpreter, mm -hmm. they will not, you, have a, you will have excluded mm -hmm. a bigger segment of the citizen. Mm -hmm. If you have a meeting where you must only do physical meeting, mm -hmm. young people will not want to come there. They will want to follow the meetings, their TikTok, they want to follow the meetings in their phone, ex-Twitter, or mm -hmm. the rest and the rest. 
and even Facebook Live. In, in other words, yes, you are yes. saying mm. public participation must be inclusive. It should be. That Man is. must include everyone. Everyone. Yes. Leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. So that's now when you can say there is effective participation. But even that public participation, at the end of it, mm -hmm. there must be a report generated that I consulted these people, this is what they said, mm -hmm. and I can't include their views in this report mm -hmm. because of one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Or they said this, this is how we have included it. Mm -hmm. That report should be available for them mm -hmm. to also to have a look at them and to build confidence that whatever you said, mm -hmm. for example, you go and put uh, a view on a budget making process, mm -hmm. then at the end of the implementation of the project, that your project was never implemented this year. Yes. If it's, what you do, if it's done the, the so-called rollover mm -hmm. for next year, mm -hmm. it should be done. But it should not be lost that you never done completely. Yes. And that's now where the citizen role is in making sure that they monitor mm -hmm. and follow yes. whether the, whatever they are proposed mm -hmm. found their way in the budget. Or, and if they find their way in the budget, mm -hmm. is there an appropriate amount allocated to them? Mm -hmm. Because, Mike, they are, they, money can be allocated to project, but it's never disbursed. Mm -hmm. Money can be disbursed into project, but a project was never implemented. It's a ghost project. Mm -hmm. And they are happening in counties. Mm -hmm. Th there are projects that were put for money in the first year of devolution mm -hmm. to date in some counties, mm -hmm. which has never been implemented. But money was paid in full. Mm -hmm. So if citizens don't follow, that's a wasted resource. Yeah. Uh, uh, briefly talk about the opportunities that are there in terms mm -hmm. of devolution and how Kenyans can tap into them. There are a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. Mike, because you see now for the first time I I in the history of Kenya, uh, you get your money irrespective whether you are supporting national government or not. Mm -hmm. Your resources envelope will come. Yes. So it means the needs of each, there's opportunity for citizens in particular part of the country. Yes. For their government to invest in their core uh, areas of development. Mm -hmm. And to deliberately, uh, if you are sugarcane growing areas, mm -hmm. if you are fish sector, mm -hmm. uh, you can invest in that sector to create wealth mm -hmm. for your people. Yes. And the opportunities are enormous yes. for counties to partner with the national government, to partner with other bilateral partners, mm -hmm. to liberate their citizens from this. There's opportunity to, to create employment for young mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. e, e also, there's also opportunity mm -hmm. to make sure that you are invest, you are small time contractors mm -hmm. are empowered by giving them job at local level so mm -hmm. that they can grow and grow and become big business people. Mm -hmm. There's also opportunity for making sure that you you help your young people who not to drop out of school mm -hmm. because you could identify your potential yeah. and make sure that the young people who have qualified who have scored well mm -hmm. are nurtured and gone to the highest level of education mm -hmm. uh, for the first time in the history you have money yes. to balance your needs yes and uh, those opportunities that we have yes. we can help create wealth yes we can help transform the health care of your people yes you can help people to have good water yes uh, so that you prevent waterborne diseases. Yes. You can have m opportunity to create wealth and make sure that each county competes favorably yes. with other counties. Uh, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to matter de mm -hmm. uh, matters mm -hmm. devolution mm -hmm. and governance, but uh, that's all the time we had for now. But I mm -hmm. hope uh, we hope to invite you again in future to talk more on this topic. Yes, yes, yes. There's a lot to talk about. We, we, we did a study. Yes. Maybe I should conclude. Yes, conclude. We did a study, uh, a civil society organization, yeah. on the citizen perspective on devolution, yeah. which we'll be launching tomorrow. Yes. Because th this has been a... a a, a debate, yes. the under the civil society uh, yeah. devolution working group. Yeah. We said they wanted to get what are people saying. Mm -hmm. So we'll be launching this study tomorrow. Yes. But from there, we'll, we'll want to go down to the 
communities. Yes. And this, the, we are now doing civic education. Yes. In the in the almost uh, all the regions. Yes. In the regional blocks. Yes. To make sure that the people's issues get their way into legislation. Yes. And also we awaken the citizen consciousness. Sawa sawa. Yes, yes. Asante sana. Thanks a lot. Thank you for okay. coming to our show. Okay. We have been talking to Chris Owala of Community Initiative Action Group Kenya on matters at devolution. This is where we cap matters. Good morning, Kenya. I have been your host, Mike Megwe. See you tomorrow morning. Channel One. We are a TV station like no other. Get a taste of the best in entertainment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Feel the passion. Will you promise me? I swear that you will never lose me. I can't get married to you. I'm sure you know. That's why you're making fun of me. Experience the drama. Get out. Who's the man in this one? Ah, and the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Move to the beat. We are live from Broadcasting House and get informed on the latest happenings. <laughs> KBC Channel One. <laughs> We are the full package. Oh, yes. And Kenya's watching. Thank you very much for joining us. TV business. Chapoy, are you ready to be a famous person? Kapsa girlfriend. Who doesn't want to look attractive like me? <laughs> a woman down, a woman down. Someone police called the ambulance. Guys. And then there's this thing called romantic attraction. Sasa ngombe wa wiri kukariso mari pa mocha, iyo ni tabu tubu. this morning's proceedings is about uh, to begin and uh, we are glad that you have made time to join us for these proceedings on this uh, 27th day of march the year 2024 
and this is a live broadcast that is brought to you by the Parliamentary Broadcasting Unit in partnership with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. In the order of business for the members of the Senate this morning is that uh, the members will, will be considering the question and statement time. This is pass one to the House Standing Order number 51 that is on the question as well as uh, the responses to the questions by cabinet secretaries. Remember, the House amended its uh, standing orders to accommodate uh, the uh, cabinet secretaries into the chambers to respond to matters of national importance. And uh, Wednesday morning is the day that was set aside for this uh, particular business. And of course, this is pass one to the House standing order number uh, 51 on questions and statements. And uh, this morning, four cabinet secretaries are lined up to appear before the Senate this morning to respond to various questions that the members of the Senate have with regards to a number of issues that are affecting uh, the country. And these cabinet secretaries include Alice Swahome, who is the cabinet secretary for lands, public works, housing, and urban development. The Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Petroleum, Davis Churchill. The Cabinet Secretary for Gender, Culture and Arts and Heritage, this is Aisha Jumwa, as well as the Prime Cabinet Secretary and the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign and Diaspora Affairs, this is Musalia Mudavadi. They will be appearing or they are set to appear before the Senate chambers this morning to respond to members' questions. And uh, this is, of course, passed on to the House Standing Order. The Senator for Kirinyaga County, Honorable James Murango, will be asking the Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Public Works, Housing and Urban Development, Ali Swahome, to provide a status report on the issuance of title deeds to public schools, particularly in Kirinyaga County. The Honorable Member will also be seeking to understand whether there are any measures that have been put in place to expedite the issuance of title deeds to public schools in Kirinyaga County that are yet to receive them. Uh, this is, or these are questions that are said to be posed by the Honorable Member for Kirinyaga County, James Murango. But as you can see, the Deputy uh, Speaker of uh, the Senate, Honorable Catherine Murungi, is in the chambers. He will be presiding over this morning's sitting. Allow me to hand you over to this live broadcast. Good morning. Uh, let's pray. Almighty God, we beseech you to behold with the abundant favor and blessings as your servants, whom you have been pleased to call to the positions in this republic. We seek guidance to treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful manner as to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of our country and of those whose interests we have committed to our charge. Amen. Shall I confirm whether we have caller? Uh, Sergeant Adams, ring the call and bell for 10 minutes. Well, that is the quorum bell underway. And this is person to 
House Standing Order number 39 and 40, that are the commencement of the House business, that is the Senate House business. The quorum of the Senate shall be 15 members seated inside the chambers, and if uh, that quorum is not achieved, when the chair is taken and the prayer is said, then a quorum bell uh, will be rung. Of course, uh, this is to give way for the members who may be on their way to the chambers to be able to get to the chambers and allow the House attain that uh, required quorum uh, to continue with its business or commence its business for the day. So if you are just joining us, then that is the quorum bell for the members to be able to walk in. Already we have members inside the chambers, and in a short time, of course, that number will be achieved. But back to the business that the senators will this morning be transacting is that four cabinet secretaries set to appear before the Senate chambers uh, to respond, of course, uh, to matters of national interest, of course, raised by the members of the Senate. Uh, the Honorable Member for Marsabit County, this is Honorable Mohamed Chute, will be asking the Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Public Works, Housing and Urban Development to indicate the respective value of each parcel of government-owned land that has been designated for the affordable housing project in Nairobi, Mombasa, Nakuru and Kisumu counties and indicate how many of the said parcels are currently being or have been developed since 2017. Also, the member will be seeking the cabinet secretary to respond to the value of parcels of land assigned to respective developers for the construction of affordable housing and whether the cabinet secretary could indicate the projected cost per square meter of each housing unit as well as the interest rate to be charged to buyers of those units. Uh, this, these are a few questions that uh, the Honorable Member for Marsabit County is seeking to ask the Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Public Works, Housing and Urban Development. Already, as you can see inside the chambers, is that uh, the position that the CSS normally take has already been set. That is the stand that they will be using to respond to these questions. We understand that already CSS have reached the uh, precincts of parliament. And of course, once the quorum is achieved and the house business starts, the cabinet secretaries will be welcomed into the chambers to attend to the business that uh, the members are set to transact this morning. The Honorable Senator for Nairobi County, this is Senator Edwin Sifuna, also will be asking the Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Public Works, Housing and Urban Development on the issue of who holds the title deed for the parcel of land on which the Tomboya Social Hall in Makadara constituency in Nairobi City County stands and whether the Cabinet Secretary could indicate the ownership history of the said parcel of land that is the Tomboya Social Hall in Makadara constituency on which that particular uh, hall sits. Also, the Honorable uh, Senator will be seeking to understand from the Cabinet Secretary whether she could explain the circumstances under which the parcel of land came into the custody of a private developer who has already commenced construction works. That is just but a few of uh, the questions that the CES uh, for lands, public works, housing and urban development will be required to respond to as raised by the Honorable uh, Senators. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Petroleum, Davis Churchill, is also set to appear before the Senate chambers this morning, of course, to respond to questions raised uh, by members. The Honorable Member uh, for Kirinyaga County, uh, this is Honorable James Murango also will be asking the Cabinet Secretary for, for Energy and Petroleum whether he is aware of the breakdown of over 15 government-owned power transformers in Kirinyaga County between March and September 2000, and this is 2023, and if so, could he explain the reasons behind it? Also, the member will be seeking to understand from the Cabinet Secretary whether he can explain the inordinate delay in replacing defective power transformers 
in Kirogo Maendeleo and Riagisheru villages within Moya constituencies despite multiple requests for their replacement. Honorable Mohamed Chute for Marsabit County also has questions for the Honorable uh, Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Petroleum, Davis Churchill. And these questions include which entities were responsible for the disruptions of power supply in most parts of the country on Saturday, 11th November 2023, and the nationwide power blackout that occurred on Friday, 25th August 2023, and could the Cabinet Secretary state any actions taken against the entities. That is the majority whip, who is also the Kakamega Senator, Honorable Boni Halwale, of course, uh, trying to see whether the members are anywhere close by within the chambers. At this point, uh, the majority whip normally whips the members into the chamber just to ensure that the House attains that required number for the commencement of the house business but as it is the number has not yet been achieved because the quorum bell is still on and if you are just joining us is that uh, uh, the senate business is about to begin for this morning's uh, proceedings the chair has already been taken but the house lacks the required number of senators for the commencement of house business 15 members are needed to be inside the chambers and uh, the lack of that number has necessitated uh, that uh, particular quorum bell. But as you understand is that on uh, Wednesday's morning sittings, the senators usually uh, ask questions to the cabinet secretaries who appear uh, before the Senate and uh, are allowed or are given an opportunity to respond to these questions that uh, are of national interest or affect different counties and the senators representing those counties have an opportunity to ask these questions to the cabinet secretaries and once the number is achieved then the house will begin its business and the cabinet secretaries whom we understand are already within the precincts of parliament then they will be appearing and they will be able to respond to these questions that the members are seeking answers to. Well, let's see whether the quorum has been achieved. Order number one, administration of oath. Order number two, communication from the chair. Order number three, messages. Order number four, petitions. Order number five, papers. Order number six, notices of motion. Order number seven, questions and statements. Honorable Senators, uh, this morning, we are expecting the CS uh, for pub uh, lands, public works, and housing. Housing and urban development to appear before the Senate. And I can see the Honorable CS has been ushered in uh, to answer questions as to uh, three, actually three questions asked, uh, asked by two, three senators. So the first question is from the Senator for Kirinyaga. But before then, uh, Madam uh, CS, welcome to the Senate. Uh, this is not your first time to appear before the Senate. And uh, we really appreciate your effort to honor the, the invitation by this Honorable House to answer the questions uh, asked by uh, these Honorable Senators. So feel welcome to the Senate. Uh, I understand Senator Morango is not alone, but he has delegated that responsibility to Senator Mbugwa. So Senator Mbugwa, ask question number 008. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I rise to ask question number 008 on behalf of the distinguished senator for Krenyaga, Honorable James Murango. Could the cabinet secretary provide a status report on the issuance of title deeds to public schools, particularly in Krenyaga County? And B, uh, could uh, the cabinet secretary 
tell this uh, House what measures have been put in place to expedite the issuance of title deeds to public schools in Kirinyaga County that are yet to, be, to receive them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Madam C. Uh, Honorable CS, can I answer that first question? Thank you, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members of the Senate. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I, I don't know whether you said it is my first time or my second time. I said for the I have been purpose. here before. You have been here before. Thank you. It's not the first time. I wanted to I thank thought you. I was on this seat when you, when you were here. Yeah, thank you, Honorable Speaker. I wanted to thank you for giving me this opportunity once again, Members of the Senate, through the Speaker. I have, I think, three questions. I will take the first one, Honorable Speaker. We have given an answer, Honorable Speaker, uh, to this question, to provide the status report on issuance of the title deeds to public schools, particularly in Kirinyaga County. I have given an answer and a list of uh, schools to answer to that question in detail. I will uh, possibly then uh, go through, with your permission, Honorable Speaker, a uh, multi-agency. In, in regard to this question, I wish to respond as follows. A multi-agency working group consisting of representatives from the Ministry of Lands, Public Works, Housing, and Urban Development was put up. The Ministry of Education and National Lands Commission, among others, were gazetted in 2018 via Gazette Notice Number 12311 to fast track the tightening of public schools. The multi agency working group spearheaded the audit of tightening status for all public schools in Kenya in 2019. According to the multi agency working group, uh, report, Kenya has over 31,000 public schools, out of which we have 5,226 public schools which have been issued with titles, while 5,799 have reservations in the registers. The summary of the status report on the issuance of title deeds for all public schools nationwide is as shown in Table 1. I don't, don't know whether, Honorable Speaker, I need to go through Table 1, but I think uh, if members have a copy of my response, yeah, maybe uh, I could get your Madam directions. Madam uh, usually the reports, the responses are provided on the system. Maybe the clerk can confirm whether that has been done for this. It is? Yes. So, Senator Chute, you know, you must know how to use your, uh, the, the, the fund before you. So you first go at, so you don't need to go through this. Yes, uh, there is the, of the, yeah. the, the titled schools per county, on number speaker 1 to 47, uh, on page 2 and page 3 of my report. It should therefore be noted that, and have given the total numbers of what we have titled and where we are supposed to be at. I've said, Honorable Speaker, that uh, we have 31,000 schools and only 5,226 public schools have titles. That means, Honorable Speaker, we have a long way to go. It should be noted that this list is not conclusive. I think this is what I would, was able to get. I am yet to verify in full details, but it won't go very far from what a number Page three is showing there as the totals with a reservation of 5799. And uh, Honorable Speaker, in Kirinyaga County, this has 335 public schools as at nine, 2019. The audit report by the multi agency group revealed that the county has 180 public primary schools and 155 public secondary schools. 78 schools have been titled 
and uh, 157 are reservations for titling, while 257 are yet to be titled. Table 2 and 3 shows the primary and the secondary schools issued with titles. When I say reservations or reserved for public use as public schools, it means the National Art Commission has already reserved that and Gazette notice being issued thereafter. The primary schools titled, as shown, Honorable Speaker, I would then say on page four, the list is there of the total number of schools in Kirinyaga. All the constituencies are listed constituency by constituency. And then for primary schools, then the secondary schools on page five, Honorable Speaker, as shown there, all the way to page six. And then the list of schools whose land had issues, issues means maybe pending court cases, as shown on page six, paragraph uh, two, Honorable Speaker. We have Gogoine Secondary School in Kirinyaga has pending case number 34 of 2016. And then Kiarogu Primary School Kirinyaga has a boundary dispute. We will endeavor, and then also Kwango Du Primary School boundary disputes, these are things we can do within the ambit of my ministry. I will undertake to look at that. Maybe the pending cases, also we can see whether there can be a resolution. And I believe the Honorable Senator who brought this question would be aware of this and could be of great assistance in resolution of the case. Honorable Speaker, allow me to proceed to then question number two. The second part of the, 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 the senator's question, part two. Yes, part two. Part B, actually, all two, part two. I wish to respond as follows. The titling of public land has been going on over the years. However, the progress has been, sh has been slow, uncoordinated, and without guidelines. In addition, the process of identification, mapping, planning, documentation, allocation, registration of public land is a multi-sectoral uh, action or activity, and uh, we uh, will endeavor to do our work. A raft of measures has been taken to fast track the school state program. Measures taken include public utilities program that was put up, and this the team has been constituted with a representative from the State Department of Lands and Swiss Co Planning, National Arts Commission, National Treasury, Ministry of Education, and Council of Governors. The reason Ministry of Edu the Treasury is the one that holds titles on behalf of the entire government, so National Treasury is a key a stakeholder there. Preparation of procedure manual on titling of public utilities land has been done. The draft procedure manual has been prepared and is currently going review by the stakers, by the stakeholders, and I want to confirm that we will be finalizing that exercise soon. A pilot program is scheduled thereafter, uh, was scheduled uh, within the year 2023 and 2024, uh, the financial year, and uh, the counties selected for that pilot program, Honorable Speaker, is Kirinyaga and Busia. A letter requesting for an update status report on all public learning institutions in the two counties has been sent also to the Ministry of Education so that we can put the the work together, or the report together, and the status report to assist the public utilities program team plan and execute the titling of all the remaining uh, schools within the two counties as a pilot. Why is it necessary, Honorable Speaker? Because we want to use the process uh, that is uh, uh, proven and uh, also for consistent purposes on a bus speaker, it helps the teams on the ground to be able to do that exercise. That's where we are with the tightening. I agree. It is slow on a bus speaker, and we need to expedite the process. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Honourable CS. Um, 
Senator Bugwa, I don't know whether you have a supplementary question. With your indulgence, Mr. Mr. Speaker, yes. I want to donate my chance to the Honorable uh, Senator of Nyeri to ask the You have no such power to do that. <laughs> it's either you have the supplementary or not. I do leave it at that. So um, I can see the Senator for Nyeri, who you have donated, is, has not even uh, requested. Yes, Senator Matinga. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, for giving me this chance. Let me start uh, by thanking the Honorable CS for her punctuality and uh, uh, well explanation of the, 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 the questions that were raised by Senator for uh, Kirinyaga. Nyeri and Kirinyaga being bordering counties, Mr. Speaker, we share uh, equally the same challenges. My question would be to the Honorable CS. Uh, primary schools have been titled. Whereas the land was donated by the same community, the churches have been left behind. So could be the, the seers uh, maybe tell us why the churches which are adjacent to schools, are sponsors of the schools, have not been issued with the titles while the schools that the sponsor have been issued. The last question, Mr. Speaker, is could the Honorable seers explain to us why the colonial villages, which are lumped, especially in Nyeri County, have not been issued with the titles despite the directive from the previous regime and the current regime. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable CS and Honorable Senators, you are intent on only one supplementary question related to the original question asked by the Senator. Yeah, so kindly respond to that, Honorable CS. Honorable Speaker, uh I want to thank the Honorable Senator for Nyeri for that uh, supplementary question. Uh, although I don't know whether the colonial village is a supplementary question uh, because it goes outside the parameter of the question raised by the Senator for, for Kirinyaga on, on churches. Uh, churches are, um, in my view, they are independent institutions. They don't they, are, they don't fall under national government once land is uh, allocated to you as a church, then it is the responsibility of the church to take up the processing of the title. And you realize that uh, it is quite a huge uh, uh, a task and therefore a huge budget, and we wouldn't do it for the we don't have a budget to do titles for churches. It's for the churches to take up, and where we need to facilitate them in our registries, we will facilitate in terms of documentation. And then on the colonial villages, I have already asked for a report on my desk for all the colonial villages, especially in Yandarawa and Nyeri, and um, I will be giving directions in terms of how to start the exercise of titling. I think there are more than 300 colonial villages in both counties, and uh, I can assure you I will work on those. I've taken it up already, Honorable Speaker. Senator Manzo Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, now that uh, we are talking of land which has not been alienated or status is not known. Could uh, the minister, who we have a long history with and is a, a stand, uh, an outstanding lawyer, uh, update us as to the status of, of the land uh, against Konza City? There are titles which have been pending for quite a while of uh, Aimi Makilungu Ranji Farm. Honorable Senator, as you know, I give guidance that uh, the questions or supplementary questions should be in line with the original question so that now the CAs, you know, our mind is on the schools tightly. But if we ask other questions which might not get answers now, then it's a big problem. So let us, as much as possible, stick to the, to, to the original question. Honorable CAs. I would, uh, yeah, thank you, Honorable Speaker. It is not possible for me to give uh, the Honorable Daniel Manzo, the Senator for Makweni, an answer now on the question he has raised. But I can, uh, we can raise and I can give him an answer maybe 
in, at another either sitting or preferably directly he can uh, contact me and uh, we'll give him the necessary response as, a, as an office. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's okay, uh, Senator Manzo. Anytime you can get the CAC. Uh, Senator, shoot a moment. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, let me take this opportunity to thank the, the Cabinet Secretary and her team, both the PS and the Secretary, for the passage of the Affordable Housing Bill, which I earlier said it was a scam. But I withdraw that, that word now and say it was a very good job. Well done, job. We've passed, we've passed 42, we, we amended 42 amendments, and uh, congratulations to this House also. Uh, let, me, let me go straight to page three. I would want the uh, Cabinet Secretary to tell this House, number 25 is Marsabit County. Out of 185 schools, only four schools has a title deed. And two other you've indicated as reservations. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary tell us what reservation is and why out of 185 schools, only four has a title deed? Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Yes, uh, Honorable CS. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, to answer the Senator, I want to say that Masabit is one of the counties that adjudication has not been completed. In fact, the tightening of schools will be part of the adjudication process, and therefore I, I think that is when we'll be able to respond or to give you a complete uh, uh, answer regarding the schools in Masabit. And of course, this particular time, I think we'll be more careful so that even as we do the adjudication, then we complete the tightening for the schools. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dulo Fatuma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, CS for a comprehensive response to the queries raised. Now, I, I want to comment on Isiolo, where we have 146 schools, there is only one with a title. And of course, you have explained what reservation is. So I want to know whether the processing of the titles is done by the schools or it's the government directly that actually uh, initiates uh, the process of uh, uh, issuing uh, titles to those schools. Mr. Speaker, if you can allow me a rider to that, the issues of encroachment on most of the government schools by private individuals, what is the government doing about it? I thank you. Yes, yes. Isuro is uh, undergoing uh, community land uh, titering. Majority of land in the Isuru will be under community land. It's one of the very difficult uh, counties, and uh, the Honorable Madam Senator would, uh, is one of the leaders in that county, Honorable Speaker, and would do us very good by bringing communities together. We are ready to do tightering. We have funding for tightering, but I can tell you there are many issues arising uh, when we start doing community tightering, honorable speaker, including disagreement on names, disagreement on uh, boundaries, but I wanted to assure her that uh, 